and deserve to live in peace, security, and dignity in a state of their own. As the Department of Defense works along the four lines of effort I articulated, Iran-backed militia groups are attacking U.S. forces. Since October 17th, U.S. bases and facilities in Iraq and Syria have been attacked 41 times. On October 26, at President Biden's direction, U.S. forces conducted precision self-defense strikes on facilities in eastern Syria used and operated by Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, IRGC, and its affiliates. We will not hesitate to take further necessary measures to protect our people. To underscore, in response to a pattern of Iranian and Iran-backed attacks against U.S. personnel and facilities in Iraq and Syria, and the continuing threat of future such attacks, the United States has taken, and as necessary, will continue to take military action against the IRGC and its affiliates. This includes the use of force against IRGC and IRGC-affiliated personnel and facilities in the U.S. Central Command area of responsibility, with the intention to convince the Iranians to de-escalate threats against the United States, our interests, and our people. Current U.S. posture in the Middle East is significant, and DOD has demonstrated its ability to rapidly project additional power into the theater. Since October 7th, we have deployed THAAD and Patriot missile defense systems, additional fighter squadrons, two carrier strike groups, and an Ohio-class nuclear-powered guided missile submarine. We also placed over 2,000 personnel and a range of units on a heightened state of readiness some of which subsequently deployed. These deployments demonstrate our commitment to Israel's security, to regional stability, and to deterring those who seek to widen this conflict. It also bolsters the department's ability to respond quickly to the evolving security environment. With respect to supporting Israel, we are working around the clock to determine which munitions and equipment from U.S. inventory can quickly be made available. Air defense is a high priority as our medical supplies, artillery ammunition, and precision guided munitions. Deliveries are taking place on a near daily basis. With respect to supporting the release of hostages held by Hamas, the department sent U.S. military personnel to Israel to provide advice and intelligence support. We are also conducting unarmed UAV flights over Gaza only to support hostage recovery. Finally, the Department of Defense is acutely focused on the importance of obligations related to civilian protection. Under the law of war, all parties to armed conflict must comply with rules for the protection of civilians. In this war, protecting and supporting civilians is difficult for a range of reasons, including the fact that it is happening in a densely populated urban environment, that Hamas is using civilians as human shields, and because Hamas placed rockets and weapons in civilian areas while digging terror tunnels underneath civilian infrastructure and protected sites like schools and hospitals. We make clear to Israel every day that efforts to mitigate and respond to civilian harm are both a moral and strategic imperative. As the Secretary's Civilian Harm Mitigation and Response Action Plan states, hard-earned tactical and operational successes may ultimately end in strategic failure if care is not taken to protect the civilian environment as much as the situation allows. That is precisely what the Department of Defense is doing. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary. I now recognize myself. Um, to start out, just so I have a, a situational awareness of what is happening on the ground in Gaza, my, uh, according to my briefings, um, the IDF, that is the Israeli uh, military forces, are beginning to circle Gaza City uh, in a very slow and, and um, determined effort to eventually bring uh, Hamas out of the tunnels um, and that a barrier or, or blocking position is being uh, built in the center of Gaza, a very narrow strip, to then eventually turn southern Gaza into a humanitarian zone. Uh, the Rafah Gate is open, about 100 trucks are going in with food, water and medicine and Israel's providing the fuel because the fuel can be used by Hamas to light up their tunnels. We don't want them to do that. We want the fuel to be used for the hospitals. Is that a fair and accurate assessment?
Let me start with how the IDF has announced the current status of its operations. It has announced that its forces have circled Gaza City with the goal of eliminating Hamas's military infrastructure in the city. The IDF has also announced uh, its intentions to create a humanitarian corridor mm -hmm. for the safe evacuation of Palestinian civilians from northern Gaza to southern Gaza. There have also been plenty of reports about Hamas blocking the safe evacuation of civilians. Uh, Chairman McCall, on uh, there are a couple of refinements I'll offer to um, to your comments about Rafa Gate and trucks and fuel. So I, I cannot stress how extraordinarily complex the operating environment is in that area of, of, of Rafa Gate. There is what they call the de facto authority, i.e. Hamas, on the other side. It's been a conflict zone at various points. Um, we have, uh, through uh, Ambassador Satterfield and his team, through the efforts of our uh, mission in Cairo, Jerusalem, and then, of course, people back here making calls, have been in a strenuous effort to keep <coughs> Rafa Gate open. But the Egyptians have had uh, a recognizably high degree of concern about insecurity there given the parlous conditions on the other side, so it's been an open and closing yeah. sort of situation. You know, I know. They, they've had quite a history, uh, Egypt. Yes, yes. Gaza. Let me <clears throat> turn, uh, Secretary Stroll, to um, these attacks on our soldiers and our troops in Syria and Iraq. Um, and I applaud the administration's support for Israel and also the force posture with the carrier strike groups and the nuclear submarine. Um, I am concerned that it took a while to respond, though. There have been 19 attacks. Uh, There's only one response, and it was after 19 attacks, I should say. So it took us, we had to wait until almost 20 attacks took place before we even came in to respond to protect our troops there. And since that time, there have been 20 more attacks. Uh, what are we doing to uh, protect our, our troops in the region? Thank you for that question, Mr. Chairman. First of all, U.S. military strikes are not the only effort that the U.S. government is putting forward both to deter further attacks and address the current attacks against us. That is why we increased posture and message very loudly about the capabilities that the U.S. military has projected into the region in less than one month. Number two, we are working in full partnership with the State Department diplomatically uh, through every possible channel to pass messages about our desire not to see regional conflict, to de-escalate, that we are focused on supporting Israel but do not seek either state or non-state actors to widen this conflict. Uh, and we have made it explicit to our partners who can pass messages to state and non-state actors. And thank you. My time is running. I, I, listen, I, I, and I agree. Deterrence is going to be the key here to prevent escalation. You know, we do not want to see Hezbollah get any more engaged than they already are with 100,000 rockets. We don't want to see that light up. And Iran, you know, is they're, it, basically they're tentacles of Iran, essentially. I want to turn to the human shield because I don't think a lot of people understand. They look at the TV and they see these innocent civilians, and we all, it breaks our heart to see human beings, you know, in this, such uh, circumstances. But if you could explain perhaps to the, me and the committee and those behind you, what Hamas does to endanger innocent civilians by using them and our hostages as human shields. For instance, there is the hospital known as Shifa, al-Shifa that has gotten a lot of attention lately. However, as I understand it, Hamas has a terrorist infrastructure located in the hospital itself and underneath in the tunnels, putting innocent civilians in jeopardy and at risk and the hostages as well. Can you, would you comment on that? The rules of international humanitarian law are clear. They apply to the Israel Defense Forces. They also apply to Hamas. One cannot deliberately target civilians or civilian objects. One cannot use civilians as human shields. Attacks cannot be indiscriminate. One cannot rape, torture, or mutilate. One cannot take hostages, and attacks cannot cause excessive loss of civilian life or damage to civilian objects in relation to their military advantage are prohibited. 
Hamas has, it is, there is documented evidence, there is plenty of images out there. Some of it, Hamas has put out itself to praise its use of terror tunnels, its obfuscation of weapons and rockets inside civilian structures, including hospitals, mosques, and schools. And my question to the two of you last very quickly, would you say that Hamas is then, according to your testimony, in violation of international humanitarian law? Mr. Chairman, yes. Secretary? Absolutely. Would you say that Hamas is also guilty of war crimes and genocide? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, we caution the, the, um, those participating to uh, not shout out. Um, we, will, uh, we appreciate peaceful protests, but we want to keep it peaceful. With that, uh, Chair recognizes Ranking Member Mr. Meeks. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and, and I want to thank you for that last uh, explanation, because I think that's something that does need to be clear in regards to who Hamas is. Um, may will come to order. The chair reminds our guests today that demonstrations for the audience will not be tolerated, including verbal outbursts. And we, again, appreciate your right to, we appreciate your right to protest under the Constitution, but we would ask that you do that peacefully and in a style that does not disrupt the proceedings. Thank you. Mr. Meeks. Thank you again, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, because we know that what's going on in the death started when it was Hamas who violated a ceasefire. It was Hamas that committed these heinous acts. And it is Hamas who have stated that these deaths, you know, these, this, it's good for, for them uh, as far as martyrdom because they will never stop until uh, they destroy Israel. So I think that that's important for the record uh, uh, to be clear. And I think it's also important for the record to be clear because I think the language, and, and I would ask uh, Secretary Leaf in regards to uh, the administration talking about a humanitarian pause, which is for the Palestinian people, as opposed to a ceasefire, which benefits Hamas. And I think that most people want to make sure that the innocent Palestinians are giving a safe space and moving forward, and that's why the administration has called for a humanitarian pause, but a ceasefire would only give Hamas, as they have stated, the opportunity to rearm themselves and do what they did on October 7th again, because they said it, they would do it again and again. Is that accurate? Ranking member, that is accurate. Um, if you would permit, I'll, I'll elaborate a bit. Uh, when the secretary came out on his uh, visit to the region last week and met with Israeli leaders at the president's request, he put on the table uh, what we believe is a, is a timeliness for humanitarian pauses. And I do stress pauses because these should be embedded into current operations and they can be. And those will uh, allow civilians to move out of harm's way. They will allow us to open up the aperture even wider to get a, a really robust flow of humanitarian assistance into Gaza, uh, and then for it to be delivered to those in need. It also uh, would likely, this would also likely um, support the efforts that are undergo, that we are undergoing to get the release of hostages and get them to safety. A ceasefire on the other end at this moment uh, would leave Hamas still in a position with uh, 200 plus hostages uh, a very large military infrastructure and the capacity to continue attacks. And by the way, a senior Hamas uh, leader last week made it very uh, clear publicly that they would look to commit an October 7th style massacre again and again and again. Thank you for that. 
So let me, let me move to a different place because I believe also there needs to be a plan in place to ensure that once Israel's military operation against Hamas has concluded, that there will be an entity in place credible to the Gazans uh, who can administer Gaza and provide basic security. And I know that Secretary uh, Blinken uh, has indicated that he thought that the Palestinian Authority might be the appropriate entity. So I want to ask you that question. You know, what is your view on the Palestinian Authority as an appropriate entity to assume control of Gaza in the future? And as well as that, I've talked to a number of others in the region, Saudi Arabia, UAE, et cetera. What can our Arab states do to assist in stabilizing and administering a Gaza in the immediate period following Hamas's removal from power? So to your first question, uh, Ranking Member, uh, the Palestinian Authority, as we all know, is the only uh, self, is the only Palestinian government uh, that has come out of the Oslo Accords. It is uh, whatever its shortcomings uh, is is the government for the Palestinians in the West Bank. Uh, we do believe that ultimately Palestinian voices and aspirations have to be at the centerpiece of post-conflict governance and security in Gaza. Um, we are looking at all of these questions right now. Um, we are, we would like to begin those discussions sooner rather than later. I would say our Arab partners, on the one hand, as we um, heard from them uh, last weekend in Amman, are very focused on the here and now. They're very focused on the issues of humanitarian, uh, the humanitarian crisis, and um, and they're focused on on obtaining a ceasefire. Uh, we are doing both things. We're focused on the here and now, but we're also looking over the hill past the conflict and what needs to come. And I, I'm quite confident uh, that we will find support in our common efforts. Um, but I, I want to stress that we do think the PA is the appropriate uh, place to look for governance eventually. My time has expired, so I yield back. Gentlemen, yields. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me, uh, Secretary Stroll, you had indicated or talked about false narratives, and I think that's a, a very important subject to, to, to speak about. Nowhere is that more uh, in evidence than at the United Nations, both in Geneva as well as in New York. Uh, I chaired a hearing uh, earlier today called United Nations Bigotry Towards Israel, UNRWA, Anti-Semitism Poisons Palestinian Youth. And we did put a focus on how young people are being trained up to hate Jews, to hate Israel, and to hate us in those UNRWA camps. And we have provided under the Biden administration about a billion dollars uh, towards UNRWA uh, and the, the entire operation. So I'm very, very concerned, as are the members of my committee when we met uh, earlier today. The false narratives, though, we, we brought out um, one particular one. It's one of many. Uh, Francesca Albanese, who's the High Commissioner for Human Rights Special Rapporteur for Palestinian Territories, uh, said that Israel has no right to defend itself. And she makes a bogus legal argument that somehow Article 51 does not apply and that they, they can't defend themselves. Uh, that kind of narrative, and there are many others like it, but she's the, one of the point people on this. Your thoughts on that? Secondly, uh, if I could, uh, is Gaza the harbinger of what a two-state solution would look like. I was on the White House lawn when Bill Clinton famously had both leaders uh, of the PLO as well as uh, uh, Israel on that lawn. We were all hopeful that Oslo would lead to a positive, peaceful outcome. And yet we see a de facto two-state in Gaza. And what are they doing? I've read the, the Hamas charter of 1988 many times. It calls for killing every Jew, and it also calls for, calls for the end of Israel, eviscerating the entire nation. Your thoughts on that? Because I think while the two-state solution seemed to have merit, we all hoped, it seems to be something that has been profoundly discredited uh, in modern times, especially now by Gaza. Congressman, thank you for your question. Uh, you know, if we go back in time to uh, the events in Gaza in 2006, 2007, Hamas essentially uh, undertook a violent coup and took over and has, has run uh, by brutal fiat ever since. So those two million plus Palestinians have really had no vote in the matter, uh, certainly not since 2006. Um, I, that would ho hardly qualify as a state in anybody's, by anybody's reckoning. I think the Palestinian uh, legitimate aspirations for statehood have been something that have been recognized now for decades by successive administrations. And uh, I th we all 
feel, uh, I, I say the we in a collective sense, uh, having consulted um, with key Arab partners this past several weeks, uh, there's a greater urgency than ever to take a negotiation forward after the conflict uh, towards uh, a two, a two, towards a Palestinian statehood, negotiating between the parties along uh, the 1967 lines with with mutually agreed swaps, but something that will give the Palestinian people uh, the governance, uh, the self-governance that they deserve, and give them a chance to live next to Israel in a in a state of of peace and mutual uh, recognition. Uh, with respect to both UNRWA and the two-state solution, what what the position of the Department of Defense, first of all, is to support our colleagues at the Department of State. There is a difference between Hamas, a U.S.-designated foreign terrorist organization, and the Palestinian people, who absolutely deserve a state of their own, which would enable Israelis to live in a secure state, as well as for Palestinians. Uh, it is an area uh, that we are constantly engaged in with our colleagues in the Israeli Ministry of Defense and the Israel Defense Forces. Could I just ask you with regards to Francesca Albanese as one example? Again, she's the special rapporteur. She should be fired. When you say there, and I've gone over her other statements that have been made uh, for quite a long time, uh, and there are many others like her, particularly in the Human Rights Council realm, uh, who are just totally, unambiguously anti-Semitic. Well, I mean, the statements, have, as you've described, I mean, certainly are unacceptable from the U.S. perspective. Um, if I if I go back, if I could go back to UNRWA, um, a Congressman, look. Uh, this has been uh, a years-long effort, and it's something that we continue to apply ourselves to, to clear out, um, uh, to bring to the attention of UNRWA, uh, to clear out anti-Semitic or any other sort of incitement language in, in education materials. But I would, I would also um, underline that right now, especially in, at this moment of crisis, UNRWA is the backbone of the strong UN-coordinated humanitarian response to the crisis uh, in Gaza. And in any post-conflict uh, setting, it will, it will serve but that again, purpose. I know I'm out of time, but the yes. textbooks and all the rest is all done by the PA. It's not done by the UN or us. Yep. We're the major contributor. Yep. Gentleman yields. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Sherman. Uh, the gentleman from New Jersey is correct as to the special rapporteur, and uh, we have sent a letter, uh, and perhaps we should send another one urging for her uh, dismissal. From the river to the sea, people should know what that means. It means kill or expel every Jew between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, a second holocaust. Now, we had a ceasefire on October 6th. Hamas's forces exploded out and killed 1,400 people, took 240 roughly hostages. Now, their fighters could have stayed in Israel and fought. Instead, they quickly retreated behind their human shields. Now, uh, we hear those calling for a ceasefire. Hamas has declared that they want a ceasefire and has declared what they would do with a ceasefire. They would regroup, and these are the words of just a few days ago of a senior member of their Politburo, and then they would do another October 7th, and another after that, and two, and three, and four times until Israel is destroyed. So those who delight in the 1,400 Israeli deaths, and the butchered babies, and the raped women, of course, join that call for a regroup ceasefire and a chance to do October 7, two, three, four, five times. Now, in any war, a country has got to weigh achieving its military objectives, avoiding casualties of its own forces, and minimizing civilian casualties on the other side. Israel has gone beyond the United States and any other country in every way to sacrifice its own soldiers, to sacrifice or delay its military objectives in order to avoid civilian casualties. When in our bombing of North Vietnam or Germany or Japan did we ever warn civilians or anyone else and give up the possible surprise? When did we provide food shipments to Nazi Germany or Japan or North Vietnam? In fact, 
It was a British and American blockade of Germany and Austro-Hungary that pretty much led to their defeat, a food blockade. When did we ever provide fuel shipments to Japan or Germany or North Vietnam? In fact, we bombed and destroyed every fuel facility we could. Yet Israel warns. Israel facilitates food and America, its ally, pays for that food. And Israel uh, uh, is uh, uh, allowing fuel in, in spite of the fact that Hamas stockpiles it. Um, as uh, I have the obscure honor of being the only CPA on this committee, and so I focused a little bit on casualty statistics. Even if you accept Hamas casualty statistics as being honest, if a Hamas fighter who happens to be 17 gets blown up by his own rocket while trying to kill Israeli civilians with it, they count that as a child casualty for which Israel should be held responsible. If a rocket falls, as one-third of them do, onto Gaza and explodes, as it did at that famous hospital, uh, they try to hold Israel responsible. And if Israel kills a Hamas commander, that death is included along the deaths that we are now told are the civilian casualties. Uh, Ms. Uh, Assistant uh, Secretary, we hear calls for a ceasefire. Is there any proof that if a ceasefire were declared today that the, uh, all the hostages would be released tomorrow or immediately? No, Congressman, there's not. There's no guarantee. Now, Israeli officials are doing a lot uh, to minimize civilian casualties. They provide the warnings. We've seen several humanitarian pauses, um, basically a permanent pause around the Rafah Gate. Uh, can you describe in other ways uh, how IDF uh, has uh, reduced civilian casualties? Or perhaps the Deputy Assistant Secretary. Let me start by adding uh, even more details to your outline of what Israel does to prioritize protection of civilians. They have dropped 1.5 million leaflets in Gaza asking civilians to evacuate. They have sent over hundreds of thousands of text messages and made phone calls to cell phones warning of their If operation. I can interrupt, did we ever provide leaflets over Hanoi? To my knowledge, no. Not I'm older, knowledge, I remember. Sir. Go ahead. Uh, we know that Israel, uh, we, in our conversations with the Israel Defense Forces, they have made very clear uh, that they assess collateral damage estimates before they take strikes. They have legal reviews through their chain of command. And when there are incidents of civilian harm, they investigate them after. Thank you. Gentlemen, yield, sir. Uh, I now recognize Ms. Wagner. Uh, I, I thank the chairman and I thank our witnesses for their, um, for their service. The United States, Israel, and our many partners in the Middle East share a common enemy, Iran. Iran and the terrorist puppets that do its bidding. We cannot waver in our support for Israel and our opposition to Iran, Hamas, and other terrorist proxies. It is the only path to peace in the Middle East. Uh, Assistant Secretary Leif, does Iran have the military capacity and intent to escalate this war, including by supporting Hezbollah uh, or the Houthis in the opening, uh, 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 and in opening additional fronts, I'll say, and how is the U.S. communicating that escalation would be unacceptably costly to, uh, for Iran and its terrorist proxies? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, yes, I would say uh, Iran certainly has the, uh, the capabilities in the sense of the uh, architecture of proxies that you've just described, uh, from Hamas, uh, to Hezbollah, to the myriad uh, Iraqi militias, uh, the Houthi, it certainly has the capacity to escalate. Uh, I would say over the course of four weeks, uh, we have been in a very steady, relentless state of messaging, of course, use of our force posture uh, um, uh, adjustments, uh, increases, uh, messaging directly uh, and through other uh, parties uh, on a constant, relentless basis. Um, and I think uh, while there has been a, a escalatory at times, um, sort of tit for tat, but escalatory on the part of Hezbollah, tit for tat at the northern border uh, of Israel, um, we have seen a success so far in keeping that escalation a capped. Uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Stroll, 
Last week, a Wall Street Journal article reported that the Wagner Group, uh, Russia's paramilitary arm, plans to provide an air defense system to Hezbollah, specifically the Russian SA-22, with concerns that Hezbollah may open up a northern front uh, against Israel, knowing the capacity that they have and the number of rockets that they have, uh, what are the ramifications to Israel's security if Russia, Russia increases the transfer of weapon systems to Hezbollah? And what is the likelihood that, that Russia will provide offensive weapon systems to Hezbollah and other proxies of Iran like Mas? Thank you for that question. I think Russia and Putin would like nothing more than for the United States to be bogged down in the Middle East with a view that that would shift our strategic focus from also ensuring that Russian aggression uh, cannot be victorious uh, in Ukraine in that war against civilians and civilian infrastructure. Uh, secondly, we have been warning for some time now about the implications for regional uh, security and stability of deepening Russian-Iranian military cooperation across the board, and that would certainly include whatever Russia might be contemplating providing to Hezbollah. I don't know if you need to move to a classified setting at some point in time, but, but discussing uh, Russia's potential uh, a movement of an air defense system to Hezbollah uh, equal to the SA-22, uh, I consider that a huge escalation, and um, I'd like to perhaps in another setting have uh, more information on it. It would be a huge escalation. It would be uh, hugely jeopardizing to Israel's security, especially when we have worked so hard to prevent the opening of a, of a second front, and would be more than happy to provide you additional information Thank in you. a closed session. I, I appreciate that. Assistant Secretary Leaf, I am gravely concerned that Iran and Iranian proxies are using the Israel-Hamas war to undermine the Abraham Accords. How is um, the State Department communicating to the region that peace with Israel serves the interests of Arab states who face serious threats from Iran and terrorist proxies? How is this message being received in the region? Thank you. So, I mean, the good news is uh, those countries that have established relations with Israel um, have a, a, an ongoing commitment to those relationships. Uh, obviously, they're strained at this point. The channels of communication are strained. Uh, they're very, these, these partners are very, um, very focused on and their publics are very focused on and enraged, frankly, uh, by the, the mounting toll of casualties uh, among civilians, Palestinian civilians in Gaza. Uh, but that said, um, I've, I've heard uh, nothing that would sway me from the belief that um, there is a day on the other side of this conflict where people will work to, will work to repair those relations because there's a common good to that. Well, and I hope that we're pushing back against the um, misinformation and propaganda that's being disseminated Absolutely. by Iran and its proxies, um, especially in these Abraham Accord countries. So I, I, I would encourage that, and my time has expired, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. General Lee yields. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Keating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to follow up on uh, the fact that uh, just in the preceding days, just before October 7th, uh, the talks uh, were extended between, with the U.S. involvement, uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia for normalization uh, with Israel. How would you categorize first the status of those negotiations at that juncture? How would you categorize them after this, and how would you categorize them in the future? I think it's important uh, for the United States to be clear uh, with our resolve to continue these talks, and I think it would be in everyone's interest in the, it's for Saudi Arabia and the other countries to do the same so that uh, any thought that uh, the success and progress of these thoughts was, in, uh, uh, was benefited from this heinous attack uh, can be dispelled immediately. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Um, I was very much involved in uh, those discussions um, uh, just prior to, in the months leading up to uh, October 7th. Uh, obviously, they're on pause at this point, uh, given the crisis in the region. Um, but uh, I think it's fair to say that Saudi leadership saw a strategic benefit um, in pursuing this. They asked the U.S. to be the midwife to this, uh, to this set of agreements. We were deep into discussions on a number of fronts. Ironically, we were just on the cusp of beginning the discussions about what we call the Palestinian component to that normalization agreement. And it's something that I would expect to um, be able to resume on the other side of this crisis. 
and um, because there is a larger good here uh, for all of the parties. Um, but I will say, you know, very candidly, uh, this conflict, this crisis has roiled up um, just a huge amount of public anger uh, towards Israel, towards us. This is something we're going to have to work through. Uh, we're, we're all, I would say, collectively uh, anxious to see this conflict over sooner rather than later, and certainly the human suffering, the human toll that it is taking end. Um, but there is, uh, there is a set of principles that underlie our engagements, and, and one of them, uh, the engagements now and the engagements post-conflict, and, and that is very squarely focused on uh, Palestinian statehood, and alongside that, a wider uh, regional effort at normalization. In your opening statement, you uh, made reference to the fact that uh, one of your primary objectives is to protect U.S. troops in the region. Now, uh, I think the United States has shown enormous restraint uh, given the uh, attacks that have been public on U.S. servicemen in that region, men and women that are risking their lives, as well as uh, the people serving in our embassies in those areas. Could you give us the status of what the current threat is to our embassies, what it is to our service people, our, our service members on the ground, uh, as well as what steps we've taken to upgrade our security uh, of both our military and civilian people on the ground in this region? So, Congressman, we'll split the question if, you, if you'll allow us. Um, in terms of our diplomatic mission, so look, since the beginning uh, hours of this uh, crisis, we anticipated that there could be public uh, churns, and there could be uh, certainly an escalation of terrorist attacks, both from known groups as well as uh, lone wolf attacks. So we've been in a steady state with all of our mission leadership of calibrating, uh, looking every day at the security situation uh, and uh, calibrating decisions about whether to, uh, for instance, uh, send home non-essential personnel or allow family members to depart uh, in some cases. So we have uh, done the necessary where we thought it was useful for embassy staffing where, uh, and if, for instance, in Iraq in our mission, uh, Consulate Erbil is still open, Embassy Baghdad is still open, but we have reduced non-essential personnel given the, uh, the volatility of the situation and, uh, and the possibilities of conflict. Thank you, Congressman. Cognizant that time is short, I'll be very succinct. Uh, there have been over 41 attacks on U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria. U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria are there only for the defeat ISIS mission in support of local partners for no other purpose. Uh, since October 17th, we have flowed additional air defense assets in to protect against the increasing pace and severity of the attacks by Iran and Iran-backed groups against our forces. We have also demonstrated, as President Biden has said, he has no higher priority than the protection of U.S. forces, that we are prepared to use military force, demonstrated that we will use force in self-defense as if we If I could, I've got five seconds left. I just want to emphasize the fact that this is uh, 13 days ago, as we sit here, Hamas was in Moscow uh, in talks that I think we'll deal with in classified session. Uh, but as our service people, as our embassies are threatened, it's important to remember Iran and Russia and their role in this as well. I yield back. Gentleman yields. Chair recognizes Mr. Mast. Thank you, Chairman. Do either of you monitor the Gaza Health Ministry? I do not. No. No. So I think it's, you know, decent to look at. It's what the lady that got pulled out was parroting when she said 10,000 civilians were killed. And it's not just what they were parroting in back there. It's literally what UNRWA parrots. And then when UNRWA parrots it, it's what Al Jazeera and New York Times and BBC and everybody else. It's what everybody else starts parroting. And I'm going to read you directly from them what, the, what they want everybody to parrot. So accordingly uh, to the uh, Gaza Health Ministry, uh, 9,770 people have been killed. This is in Gaza. 70% were women, children, older persons, 24,158 uh, people injured, 2,260 reported missing, uh, you know, at one point, 521 families, 3,109 uh, citizens, and, and they give very specific information. Do you notice anything glaringly missing from what I just mentioned to you from the, the Gaza Health Ministry report? Is there anything that strikes you as glaringly missing? 
I'm sorry, I, I don't I don't know what you're referring to. Combatants. They didn't mention the word combatants. No, at because all. they mingle them. Exactly. That's exactly the point. They they expect the world to believe that that all these people and these these groups that they're dividing up to families and older persons and children, which they consider anybody under 18, and women. That, that none of them are combatants. That's what they want the world to believe, and that's what the United Nations goes out there and parrots, and that's what the media goes out there and parrots. So I want to get to a few of those points because it leads to a circle that's going on, and the circle is this. We all, and this shouldn't be provocative to anybody, Hamas lies. Hamas and Palestinians lie. It's their government. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've had a number of my colleagues that have agreed with me on Twitter that it's their government, uh, even though they tried to censure me on this. But... Uh, you know, and then they say they lie, but then they pretend everybody is a victim. And then after they say everybody's a victim, there's anti-Semitic uh, riots and terrorism. And then after that happens, then there's people, members and others, that call for ceasefires in another country and things like this. So I want to ask a few questions on that. Are all combatants men in this war? We're not on the ground and would not be in a you think position all, to confirm. Do you think they're all men? You're in DOD. You monitored Iraq and Afghanistan. Are all combatants men? Generally speaking, all combatants are not men. Thank you. Are they all over the age of 18? Broadly speaking, uh, there are plenty of designated foreign terrorist organizations who use children uh, in, in combat. Are they all young adults or some of them are older adults? Congressman, I'm not a lawyer. Okay. Are they all in, in Gaza? Are all combatants Hamas? No. Are they only individuals that wear black hoods and, and green, green headbands? Hamas, just like any terrorist organization, certainly. Not just Hamas. Other organizations like Palestinian Islamic Jihad also, I'm sure, don't only parade in the streets in identifiable uh, uniforms. That's right, and it's not just Hamas, like you just mentioned. Now, when I brought this up, which I think is very important to bring up, to, to identify who's innocent and not innocent, of which I absolutely acknowledge there are innocent people there, even though, again, that has been stripped from me uh, from comments from my colleagues, when I brought that up, my colleague up here, who's missing now, probably conveniently, asked me if I was a member of the KKK. And one of my colleagues over here also tried to censure me for distinguishing between innocent and non-civilian and trying to actually look at who is and who isn't. And this is the big problem about that lie. That lie is actually worse than the Al Ali hospital bombing lie that was told by Rashida Tlaib in the New York Times and the Associated Press. Because that is a much more persistent lie that Hamas is begging. Palestinians are begging members of Congress to make. They're counting on the fact that people here won't try to distinguish that it's not just Hamas terrorists. It's also Palestinians, it's also women, it's also under 18, it's also older people. And when they do that, they get that circle of lies where they think everybody thinks over there they're a victim, and then they get the anti-Semitic riots and terrorism, and then they get the people calling for, for ceasefires and, and for making them a second state. And that's why that lie and, and these people unwilling to question that and yelling at me for questioning that, are creating a much more persistent problem than even what Rashida Tlaib put out there. And I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, yields back. Chair recognizes Mr. Barron. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member. Um, you know, the, the events of October 7th are tragic. Um, you know, having spent some time in Israel, you know, twice in the past few months prior to October 7th, having been to Surat, having previously been to, having lunch with some of the, the kibbutzes that, that were attacked. You know, many of those individuals that I met, many of the young people were the, the most pro finding a, a two-state solution. And you know, what's tragic about October 7th is I, that may be an impossible dream for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, we stand with Israel. We stand with Israel's right to defend itself. We stand that um, Israel is a Jewish homeland. Um, but 
you know, was reading an article in the New York Times this morning um, where they were quoting Hamas's leadership on what their intent was. And their intent and their fear was that the Palestinian cause was slipping away. It wasn't central to, to dialogue. Um, they were watching our facilitated negotiations with Saudi Arabia and Israel. They were watching the Abraham Accords. And their goal was to, you know, there's not a tactical strategic benefit to beheading a baby or killing a child in front of their parents or killing a parent in front of a child. That's to provoke terror. That's to provoke a reaction. And just quoting um, Hamas's leadership, they wanted this reaction. They wanted and anticipated um, that Prime Minister Netanyahu, that the Israeli government, the IDF, would have to respond to, to this terror and a, and a heinous attack. Um, and Hamas, you know, from my calculation, understood that there would be a, a major civilian toll, and they would want to use that, the loss of innocent Palestinian civilian life um, to start to bring the Arab world back into a focus on um, the Palestinian cause, that they will continue to do this because it is their strategy to continue to provoke terror, to t try to foment unrest in the, the, the streets. Um, and you know, I do worry that Prime Minister Netanyahu's response um, is do exactly what, the Palis what Hamas wants them to do, which is now also isolating Israel, and the world is creating anti-Semitic attacks on our college campuses around the world. Um, and again, this is not talking about a ceasefire. This is a war between Israel and Hamas. We support Israel's right and um, actually will work with them to um, decapitate Hamas, erode Hamas's ability to ever perpetrate an attack like this again. But it is, and maybe this is a question for um, Secretary Stroud, there are other legitimate ways to prosecute this war against Hamas um, and perhaps minimize um, innocent Palestinian casualties. Um, and I would imagine that we're in conversation with the IDF, with the Israeli government, to think about what those are, special operators, et cetera, while protecting the Israeli homeland. Absolutely, we are. Consistently, Israel is a democracy, democracy with whom we share values. They have an obligation both to take action to defend their people and their, and their country and ensure that Hamas can never again perpetrate a terrorist act like it did on October 7. And they also have an obligation to distinguish between terrorists and militants and civilians who deserve access to humanitarian aid and protections consistent with the law, with international humanitarian law and the law of armed conflict. The Israelis are absolutely aware and cognizant of it, and we have conversations with them every day. And perhaps for Secretary Leaf, um, you know, none other than Naftali Bennett and others and open sources have suggested a different strategy. And, you know, a, a strategy that says Israel is going to occupy Gaza, I think our own Secretary of State has said an occupation of Gaza is not, not possible and I think would be a bad strategy. Is that? Yeah, Congressman, in fact, I'd, I'd love to quote a few things that uh, from Secretary Blinken said today in Tokyo at the G7 ministerial because it gets to a number of points that you've made. He said the only way to ensure that this crisis never happens again is to begin setting the conditions for durable peace and security and to frame our diploma uh, diplomatic efforts now with that in mind. The United States believes key elements should include no forcible displacement of Palestinians from Gaza, not now, not after the war, no use of Gaza as a platform for terrorism or other violent attacks, no reoccupation of Gaza after the conflict ends, no attempt to blockade or besiege Gaza, no reduction in the territory of Gaza. And I would add to that a few affirmative principles that I know the Secretary uh, feels very strongly about um, and that inform our, our, our approach now and they will certainly inform our approach after, which is that, as I said earlier, Palestinian people have to be at the center of post-conflict <laughs> governance. The West Bank and Gaza must ultimately be treated as a, as a common uh, polity, if you will. We have to look to rebuild a road that's long been missing towards negotiations for the Palestinians because what we've seen, uh, and you touched on it in your opening remarks, is a real weaponization of an unresolved issue 
uh, an unresolved legitimate aspiration for statehood. It's been weaponized by Hamas, and Hamas has an ultimately uh, dark and nihilistic sort of uh, a savage kind of vision uh, for uh, for that cause, and it is not one that, frankly, most Palestinians uh, align with. But um, but Hamas and other members of Iran's so-called axis of resistance are are very much are are very much uh, desirous of weaponizing that that issue, and so we must take it away from them. Frankly, the gentlemen's time has expired. Ch uh, chair recognizes Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Assistant Secretary, it's your service uh, of state and defense has never been more important. Uh, it's really bipartisan. We want you to be successful. We want the President to be successful. It's critical for uh, American families that you be successful. I'm very grateful with the leadership of Chairman Mike McCall, the Ranking Member Greg Meeks. Uh, it is bipartisan that we want you to succeed. But it's so critical because, indeed, I believe the Washington Post is correct last week when they cited that American families are at greater risk today of another 9-11 mass murder than ever. And so this, we've just got to be together and, and uh, get these issues addressed. And to me, it's uh, perfectly sadly clear that we're in a war we did not choose, of dictators with rule of gun invading democracies with rule of law. And it's an axis of evil. Uh, it began with the war criminal Putin when he conducted mass murder on February 24, 2022, uh, uh, invading Ukraine. It then, on October 7th, we know the massacre by the Iranian puppets who came in to massacre the people of Israel. Uh, just, uh, just so clear, so sad. And we also know the Chinese Communist Party has indicated that Taiwan, 24 million people, do not exist. Uh, we've just got to be working together and. I um, am just so concerned that uh, all of this leads to death to Israel, death to America, uh, uh, being American families. And then, indeed, uh, Madam Secretary, when you mentioned about uh, Hamas and uh, their perverted view of the world, uh, indeed, American families and also civilized civilization uh, should know uh, that uh, the ha Hamas covenant of August 18. 1988, uh, in the midst of insane provisions, is Article 7, quote, the day of judgment will not come about until Muslims kill Jews, fight Jews, and kill them. Then the Jews will hide behind rocks and trees, and the rocks and trees will cry out, O Muslim, there is a Jew hiding behind me. Come and kill him, end of quote. Uh, it should not be um, ignored. There were people carrying signs here in Washington on Saturday and Sunday about trees and rocks. Uh, this is what it is, killing uh, Jews. With that in mind, it's also, again, bipartisan. Congressman uh, Keating, I appreciate uh, what he stated, and that is that we've had U.S. forces come under fire in Iraq and Syria more than 40 times from the Iranian uh, puppet forces. Dozens of Americans have been reported injured in these attacks. Uh, sadly, to me, it's been concealed from the American people how serious this is. The U.S. has responded militarily just one time, attacking apparently an empty warehouse. Um, with the technology we have today, um, Secretary Spruill, uh, we should be able to identify the location of the launching sites, and they should be responded to immediately uh, and not discussed or whatever. We've got the technology. We need, wh why, is, why are we not acting um, to protect the American people. Thank you, Congressman, for your question. President Biden has been clear that he uh, has directed self-defense strikes in protection of our forces and will do so again. There is no higher priority. It is quite clear uh, that Iran and its proxy groups are escalating against U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria, and we have a range of options at our disposal to, to defend ourselves. And, and indeed, I have uh, a staff person in the region. Uh, I'm so concerned, and all of us have family members. My uh, four sons have served in Iraq, Egypt, and Afghanistan. Uh, the thought of uh, I'm, it's good that we're providing uh, air defense capability, but we should be going after the launch sites. Uh, they uh, can be identified. That's just with the technology we have today. To me, it's inexcusable. Why, why are we not going after uh, identifying and going after the launch sites. 
Congressman, I can't speak to every uh, specific operational decision. I'd be happy to brief you more in a closed session, but I will also uh, say that Iran and its proxy groups uh, disguise many of its uh, warehouses, depots, and launch sites in areas that have civilians around, and so the U.S. military takes precautions and assess how we're going to respond based on pr proportionality, necessity, and distinction. And, and hey, for years, anytime there would be an attack uh, by Hezbollah, Hamas, or Houthis, uh, the American media covers the Iranian response, uh, Israeli response, not the attack. And so let's get ready for that, because you're going to be, we are going to be accused of being the perpetrators when, in fact, there should be self-defense. I yield back. Joan Yields, Chair recognizes Mr. Castro. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I think that all of us, or almost all of us, were shocked and enraged by the attack on October 7th. Uh, I certainly expressed that. I have been concerned since then about how the Netanyahu administration has carried out its response. I don't have faith or confidence that Prime Minister Netanyahu can protect Israelis, will follow the humanitarian rules of war, or prevent a larger regional conflict that will rope in the United States. Do you know how many missiles have hit Gaza now? an area that's 141 square miles. I, I ask that of either witness. Uh, Congressman, I don't have the specific number of airstrikes at my disposal. The, the latest estimate that I saw was about 20,000. And as far as I can tell, there have only been about five hostages that have been released. It seems to me that Prime Minister Netanyahu is prioritizing collective punishment over the release of hostages. And I'm very concerned about that. Please. Thank you for that question. Um, I'm not going to characterize the prioritization of the Israel Defense Forces. What they, what their operations in Gaza are intended to dismantle the military infrastructure of Hamas that made it possible to perpetrate an attack like the world saw on October 7th. And, and I want to be clear, I think they should be able to protect themselves against a similar attack. We have long supported them in their ability to do that. But they also directly struck an ambulance. They struck uh, refugee shelters two or three times. Uh, how do you, how do we, how do we, how do we explain that? As we take votes for support, uh, you know, as we, as we try to assess the situation, uh, I think just as, as the world is aghast at the barbarity of what happened October 7th, the world also looks at that and asks the question about why an ambulance, why 30-something members of the press have been killed, uh, why four or 5,000 children have already been killed. They're extremely serious questions, uh, and we should hold Israel and the Israel Defense Forces to the same standards that the U.S. holds any ally or partner, and that is adherence to the law around conflict and necessity, distinction, and proportionality in its execution and implementation of its military operations. With respect to the ambulance convoy, this is a good example of the misinformation and disinformation environment. The Israel Defense Forces announced that they saw Hamas terrorists using the ambulance uh, to conceal militants and weapons. Uh, it is also incumbent on the Israel Defense Forces and the Israeli government to make that to make that information known so the world can understand how Hamas disguises, its, disguises itself and its tactics in civilian structures. Uh, I had read uh, very disturbing reporting a few days ago that has been fairly consistent that there has continued to be a lack of substantial or necessary food and water that has reached Gaza, that, that the water system, for example, is out. Uh, can you please tell us what the latest humanitarian situation is there? Uh, yes, uh, Congressman, the water system has been uh, a focus of our efforts. Um, the water was initially shut off. We, um, we got the Israelis to turn it back on. Some of the pipes, there are several major pipes. Uh, they've sustained damage at different times. Uh, we, they, the Israelis have uh, worked to, um, to repair uh, the damage where they could. Uh, the operating environment for getting humanitarian assistance in is unbelievably complex. And as I said, it's this combination of 
the Egyptians having very legitimate concerns about uh, uh, influx of fighters uh, disguised as. Uh, I, I guess because uh, I'm running yes, out of time, sorry. I want to ask one more question, yes, perhaps for the record. But uh, uh, but I would ask that that the State Department, that the Biden administration, do everything it can to make sure that humanitarian assistance, regardless of who's holding it up makes its way to the people there. My final question, I'll try to read it in time. On Monday, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu said that he intends for Israel to have, quote, overall security responsibility over Gaza for, quote, an indefinite period. Uh, Israel's heritage minister, who proposed nu using nuclear weapons on Gaza and was not forced to resign for that statement because uh, Benjamin Netanyahu for his coalition is partly beholden to the far right, has proposed establishing settlements in Gaza. Uh, this week, National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby said that the president does not believe that a reoccupation by Israeli forces is the right thing to do. Uh, for the record, what alternatives to an Israeli reoccupation have you raised with the Netanyahu administration? And does the Biden administration oppose establishment of settlements which are illegal under international law in Gaza? Yes, we absolutely oppose them, and we also oppose the reoccupation of Gaza by Israel Thank or you. any other country. I yield back. Human yields. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Burchett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and thank you all for being here. I'm greatly concerned about the safety of Israel and for the safety of Jewish Americans. The responses we've seen around the country to the October 17th, October 7th attacks, excuse me, especially at some of our colleges and universities, to me, is a problem, especially our public, public institutions. I'm a great supporter of the exercise of the First Amendment, and I believe it is critical for the American way of life. But people must be allowed to speak freely and assemble peacefully. But when that speech is in favor of terrorists, we must look at the underlying issues. Why did students rally in support for Hamas, a group that viciously attacked innocent people, beheaded and burned children, and raped young girls? This is because our younger generations are not taught everything that the greatest generation learned through war. Evil is evil, and it must be stopped. The fact that these rallies for Hamas were even allowed is beyond troubling. Allowing these protests is an educational progress. This is progressivism at its worst. Students and others that rallied in support of the actions on October 7th have proven their lack of historical knowledge. Eighty years ago, this country went to war with the Axis powers that sought to destroy any way of life that they felt was in fear to their own. My family knows those, these people well. I lost an uncle to the Nazis and my daddy fought the Japanese in the Pacific. And then he went on to China and fought the communists there for a short while. This is the type of enemy we promised the world we would never allow again. I support the efforts of Israel to rid the world of a group that is hell-bent on murdering Jews. Our attention to this tragedy must be twofold. We must support Israel in this fight. We must educate our young people that evil is evil and must be dealt with. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the remainder of my time. Gentleman yields. Uh, chair recognizes Ms. Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our uh, witnesses. As you have heard all of us say, but I'll say it for the record myself, uh, on October 7th, we all watched in horror as Hamas terrorists murdered, tortured, raped, and kidnapped over 1,400 Israelis. 32 Americans were also killed in that attack. This grotesque assault on our closest ally in the region deserves universal condemnation from every member in this body. The U.S., the U.N., and much of the international community have designated Hamas as a foreign terrorist organization. Their stated goal is the destruction and decimation of all Israeli people. Their actions have also demonstrated their indifference towards the safety of Palestinian people. There is absolutely no room for sympathy or equivocation when it comes to Hamas. And about that, we should be absolutely clear. I join my colleagues in applauding President Biden for his stalwart support of Israel during this time, and I commend Secretary Blinken for his master class in shuttle diplomacy to shore up the U.S. bilateral relationships with our regional partners and to lay the groundwork for intensive diplomatic efforts to achieve sustainable peace. Words do matter, and the, what we talk about in this committee and in Congress also matters. That's why urging for an adherence to international law and the laws of war while ramping up humanitarian aid is so important. This assertion is not anti-Israeli, 
Prime Minister Netanyahu himself has agreed to this in principle. I echo President Biden's calls for temporary localized pauses to allow for surges of humanitarian aid, but I remain opposed to a long-term durable ceasefire until all hostages are returned and certain commitments are made by Hamas. A premature ceasefire would give Hamas a reprieve and allow them to regroup, reorganize, and rearm. I also urge at the same time, though, the IDF to reconsider its tactics to ensure its counterterrorism campaign is proportionate. Again, these remarks should not be misconstrued as le delegitimizing Israel's campaign to root out Hamas. We cannot accept the false choice that Republicans have been pushing on us when they say you either support Israel in its war effort or you support Hamas. Bolstering Israel's defense and urging the protection of innocent Palestinians are, mutu are, not, excuse me, are not mutually exclusive ideas. We can and we must do both. <coughs> I'd like to ask my question, though, uh, more specifically about Turkey. Uh, Ms. Stroll, Turkey uh, consistently tops the list of U.S. arms importers and recipients of U.S. military aid. Uh, because it's considered a strategic NATO ally. I believe Turkey's relationship with Hamas alone is enough to cease all arm exports to Ankara uh, as Erdogan continues to express his sympathy for Hamas, not to mention the fact that Turkey has routinely acted as a spoiler within the NATO alliance. The Arms Export Control Act requires the U.S. government to conduct in-use monitoring of where these military um, exports go. I wonder if there have been any indications that Turkey's relationship with Hamas has resulted in the transfer of weapons of U.S. origin to Hamas by Turkey. And how is the U.S. government able to ascertain and deal with that? Thank you for your question, Congresswoman. Uh, as part of any foreign military sale to any partner or ally, there is robust end use monitoring uh, for how those weapons are used. We have no indication that anything provided to Turkey has fallen into the hands of Hamas. Well, that's reassuring. Uh, I would just ask you, too, how you are balancing the relationship with Qatar and Turkey in terms of their assistance with hopefully getting out some of the hostages uh, and their uh, having Hamas leadership within their boundaries, visiting. Congresswoman, what I would say is the following. Um, Qatar and Egypt, but especially Qatar, have been um, profoundly involved in the, in the relentless quest to secure the release of hostages, um, uh, foreign hostages, Israeli hostages, the whole lot. Uh, they've also been engaged in a very intensive effort to help with the, uh, help Ambassador Satterfield in his efforts to get uh, humanitarian assistance in uh, and uh, foreign nationals out, something that has been impeded repeatedly by Hamas. Of course, the military leadership is well uh, protected underground, uh, far from, uh, from uh, the conflict above. The political leadership is the external piece through which um, uh, the Qataris are, are, are working um, and uh, the Egyptians as well. The last time has expired. Chair recognizes Mr. Barr. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In, in response to my uh, colleague on the other side of the aisle who um, is expressing this idea of proportionality with respect to uh, Gaza, I think it's important that um, in this moment, in the face of this barbarism uh, from Hamas terrorists, that uh, we're careful not to, to use nuance too much. What we need right now is moral clarity, and nuance is not really uh, uh, apropos at the moment. Um, as you uh, said in response to my colleague, um, there is a lot of misinformation. Uh, why an ambulance? Because it was full of Hamas terrorists and weapons. That's why an ambulance. Moral clarity requires that we call out terrorism for what it is. And when, and when, um, and when there are calls for a ceasefire uh, uh, that would only enable Hamas to reconstitute another attack, that's not appropriate either. So, Ms. Leaf, I do want to address Secretary Blinken's call for Israel to uh, provide a humanitarian pause. We all support humanitarian assistance for the innocent, 
but those running Gaza do not care about humanitarian needs, as you, as you know and as you've testified. Did Hamas prevent innocent Palestinians from fleeing Gaza City to safer locations further south in Gaza? Absolutely. And does this make it harder for those people to access aid? Absolutely. And Ms. Leaf, uh, is Hamas actively hoarding resources to pursue its Islamic jihadist war against Israel instead of providing water, fuel, and food to those affected by war? Yes, they are. And Ms. Leaf, do you feel Hamas would use any pause in Israel's effort to root out terrorist cells and uncover Hamas's urban terrorist network to resupply its warfighters? They would certainly attempt to. Uh, but that is something that I know that the Israeli government is actively considering. So I, I hope that the secretary and the president uh, consider that when, when calling for a humanitarian pause. Did President Biden condition any support for Israel on the IDF engaging in a pause? No, he did not. Well, that's good to hear. Um, let me follow up on the line of questioning re regarding our partner uh, uh, in, in Qatar. Um, of course, uh, the Qataris have been very uh, helpful with Al Udid Air Base, and we appreciate that. Um, but with respect to releasing hostages, uh, how helpful have they been? Are they using uh, their considerable uh, leverage to seek the release of all hostages immediately? They absolutely are. They've worked at it relentlessly. The problem is uh, who, the, who they're talking to at the other end of the phone line. Uh, and uh, it's a real question as to whether Yahya Sinwar is serious in any degree about releasing those hostages. And uh, is the Hamas office in Qatar seeing any pressure from the Qatari government? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's good to hear. Uh, I, I do think the Qataris are important partners uh, for us, but we want to make sure that uh, we emphasize to them how, how helpful they can be in this moment. Uh, they want to be kind of the the Switzerland of the Middle East, they can be very, very helpful in this moment, and I appreciate uh, us uh, uh, taking advantage of that relationship. Taylor Forsack, real quick, Ms. Leaf, with the war ongoing, how are we ensuring that any U.S. support to NGOs operating in Gaza are not violating the Taylor Force Act? Are we seeing any support for the families of Hamas terrorists killed during the invasion of Israel in exchange for their participation? We are not seeing any of that, and we have uh, asked the question and received the right assurances. Is the administration reconsidering this idea of providing uh, assistance to NGOs, uh, 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 you know, s supposedly pro-Palestinian NGOs, as a way of bypassing or circumventing the Taylor Force Act? We do not bypass or circumvent uh, the, the, the letter or the spirit of the Taylor Force yeah, Act. I just think there ought to be some analysis of uh, aid that may not go to the Palestinian Authority, but nevertheless goes to NGOs that could uh, serve as a kind of proxy for uh, uh, martyr payments. And so I just want rigorous oversight from the State Department uh, so that this, both the spirit and the letter of Taylor Force is complied with. I can assure you of that, Congressman. Uh, f um, finally, um, this issue of sanctions relief and the Financial Services Committee, we, we had a, a, a very important testimony about the $16 billion dollars uh, that was unfrozen, um, both in terms of the South Korea deal with the hostage deal and also the $10 billion held in Iraq, Iraq to pay off Baghdad's debts for its purchase of Iranian natural gas. It's a lot of money that has, that has been basically effectively sanctions relief uh, delivered to Iran as a result of this administration's policies. Is the Biden administration reconsidering chasing sanctions relief with Iran? in light of the events of October 7th. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't understand the verb you used. Uh, are, is the Biden Ch administration changing? Ch chasing sanctions relief with Iran. Had, has the administration reconsidered that course, that policy given October 7th and, and, and the events that have occurred? So the, the monies you, um, you referred to from South Korea that have been uh, moved um, to different accounts that will be put through a rigorous uh, metered uh, process that will only be spent uh, on humanitarian goods, food, and, and <clears throat> medicine, and so forth. That is not altered. Uh, that was an arrangement set up by the previous administration, and we are rigorously applying the same restrictions to it. The money has not moved. The the monies you referred to for natural. Uh, I'm sorry. I, the, I'm just in fairness to the witnesses and to the other members. I, I want to keep this on time. My, okay. my time has expired, but I think the line of questioning illustrates the point that maximum pressure was working and, and moving away was the, the wrong move. Thanks. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, chair recognizes Ms. Wild. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, for both witnesses, are there any updates that either of you can provide in this 
unclassified setting regarding the status of the hostages? I could not. I'd be happy to talk to you in a different setting. Thank you. Same for you. Okay. Let, let me ask you this. Is the administration in continuous contact with the Israeli government about the status of the hostages, and can we be assured that the administration will uh, provide whatever assistance may be helpful in that effort? 24-7, I can assure you. And Thank yes, you. we are providing all support. Thank you. Um, moving on, ever since these horrible attacks, um, which don't need to be further described because we all know exactly what we're talking about happened on October 7th, um, I personally have felt devastated. Um, so many Americans have, um, as well as people around the world, I felt that both as an American and a member of Congress, but also as a, as a Jewish American. But that heartbreak has been amplified um, by horrific cases of both Palestinians and Jewish Americans being targeted here in the United States, including the unthinkable murder of um, Wadi al Fayum, the six-year-old Palestinian-American boy in Chicago, as well as the death of a 69-year-old Jewish man, Paul Kessler, after he was injured during an altercation at a, at a rally or t competing rallies while he was peacefully waving an Israeli flag. And that obviously is of deep concern to all of us for the safety of Americans generally, for the safety of people with Palestinian or any kind of Arabic background, as well as um, people who are Jews. Um, and my concern is that in this climate, rhetoric that equates everyday Palestinians, civilians, let's just call them civilians, to Hamas, um, including at times in this body, Congress, um, is not just morally unacceptable, but it's also tantamount to actively endangering the lives of our fellow Americans. Um, and I, I will say that as a representative of a district that includes a vibrant Jewish community, as well as a vibrant Palestinian American community and, and other Arab American and Muslim communities, these issues are, are really personal to me and many of my constituents. Um, so let me, well, first let me ask whether both of you agree with the premise that Hamas is a terrorist organization. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and do you, would you agree that the rhetoric that equates Palestinian civilians or Palestinian Americans um, with Hamas is rhetoric that actually strengthens Hamas and undermines Israel's security um, by feeding into their propaganda that um, Hamas is a legitimate representative of the Palestinian people? We absolutely make a distinction. Uh, the, the Pal the Hamas as a terrorist organization has perpetrated a, a, a brutal set of attacks. Uh, the Palestinian people don't deserve to be lumped in um, in such a way, and so we absolutely distinguish in our discussion of that topic. And did you want to add anything to that? It is, uh, I completely agree with Assistant Secretary Leaf. Uh, the Palestinians in Gaza deserve much better than Hamas, and it is critical from a Department of Defense perspective that military operations distinguish between targeting Hamas and protecting innocent Palestinian civilians. Thank you. I want to I turn to something else just because of the shortage of time. Um, I'm, I'm con very, very concerned about the humanitarian assistance to innocent civilians in Gaza. Um, and we know that the only place where this is available is through the Rafa crossing, which seems to have uh, alternating um, access and the availability of passing through. As of a couple of hours ago, according to an article that I just saw during this hearing, um, the crossing's been shut down due to some sort of security incident. Um, can you speak about ongoing efforts to increase the amount of aid and how to get it to the innocent civilians? Um, Ambassador Satterfield and his team, uh, backstopped by uh, here in Washington, but backstopped by our missions in Cairo and Jerusalem, is working relentlessly. 
the env uh, operating environment is so phenomenally uh, complex and the security conditions on the other side in Gaza are parlous um, that it has been a, 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 just an exhausting effort to keep that aperture open. But that is what we are focused on and we are determined to steadily um, increase the number of trucks um, over this next period. It's now about anywhere from uh, 70 to 100. We want to get it up to 300, 400, 500. Gentlemen, uh, time's expired. Chair Thank recognizes you. Mr. Jackson. Jack. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My first question is for you, uh, Secretary Leaf. Um, Professor Alan Dershowitz recently uh, talked about a Hamas strategy that he referred to as the CNN strategy, or what others have labeled the dead baby strategy. The basic concept is that Hamas attacks Israel in a manner that it knows will draw a military response. Then in a strategy that can only be described as barbaric and cowardly, Hamas retreats into its strongholds, as we've been discussing, and uses Palestinian civilians as human shields. Not that Hamas has any regard for the for the law uh, for the uh, law of war, or are there any any other rules for that matter? But engaging in disgusting acts such as this is a complete and utter violation of the law of armed conflict. Israel does its best, I think, to avoid civilian casualties, and in this conflict, gave civilians time to depart from northern Gaza, uh, an, an act which Hamas reportedly attempted to block. And I, I heard earlier today that there was also uh, things that, that uh, just millions of uh, flyers were dropped all over northern uh, Gaza. They made uh, thousands and thousands of phone calls uh, to evacuate people before anything happened. So I think they're doing their best to uh, to avoid this. Uh, but eventually, there are civilian casualties with this uh, with, with this setup. Uh, Hamas then blames Israel as the guilty party, claiming that they are willingly killing innocent civilians. The success of this CNN strategy depends on the mainstream media and, unfortunately, uh, per uh, perhaps uh, uh, members of Congress, uh, as we recently heard here with the ambulance comment, which anyone who, who uh, knew of the ambulance story certainly knew that it was filled with Hamas fighters because every story I saw on every channel, uh, they were grouped together. So anyways, but it, it, it relies on uh, them buying into this narrative and allowing itself to be used as a tool of Hamas. So, Secretary Leaf, I was just wondering what efforts, if any, is the administration undertaking to ensure that Hamas in their CNN strategy is ineffective? Uh, specifically, what is the administration doing to push back on Hamas' false narrative and to show American people in the world that Israel has an inherent right to self-defense, that Israel's current operation is on solid legal footing, and that Hamas is the one that is violating the law of war in numerous ways? What are we doing to stop this spread of this misinformation? Uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, you know, uh, the, the point of uh, the point of uh, the point of uh, Hamas's operations is terror, full, full stop, and they are masters of propaganda, as you note. Um, the good news is that most governments around the region well recognize what kind of entity that uh, you know, th that we're dealing with. The publics are inflamed. There's no question. The publics are inflamed by mounting uh, by images of mounting casualties, uh, and um, and that's a, that's an issue across the region. We are in a, a constant tempo of direct engagement discussions, uh, public affairs efforts uh, to uh, to really set the record straight. But it is quite it is quite a challenging environment for just the reasons you cite. Thank you. I appreciate. I'll be doing your best you can, but I think it's going to be more important as time goes on to uh, to up that game a little bit because as this war goes on, uh, that narrative is just going to grow and grow. Uh, Ms. Uh, Stroll, my next question is for you. Uh, the Biden administration recently presented testimony before this committee explicitly asking that Congress uh, not include Iranian-backed proxies in a new uh, authorized use of military force that we're considering. Uh, since, as you noted in your opening statement, Iran-backed proxies in Iraq and Syria have launched at least 41 attacks on U.S. service members, while Hamas and Hezbollah continue to attack our friend and our ally Israel on a daily basis. Given the increased threat posed by Iranian-backed groups and proxies, has this administration's position on whether to include Iran-backed groups and proxies in a new AUMF changed? Thank you for your question, Congressman. The position of this administration has not changed. Uh, our self-defense strikes against Iran-backed militia groups uh, have the underpinning of the President's Article II authority under the Constitution. Okay. Uh, I guess that's a question for a later day. I, I would think that uh, if we're going to include other groups, that maybe this would be uh, one of the ones that we'd want to include as well, despite what you what you stated there, uh, since they seem to be one of our biggest threats right now. But uh, Secretary Stroll, 
Um, given, well, this is my last question, uh, given the chaos on the ground, uh, the entrenchment of Hamas among the Palestinian people, and Hamas's history of misappropriating aid intended for civilian populations, what realistic and meaningful guardrails are being employed by the Biden administration to prevent Hamas from obtaining the food, the water, the medicine, and the other humanitarian aid that is intended for civilians? Um, I'd be happy to take that one, Congressman. Um, so to date, we have not uh, seen evidence that they have uh, diverted that aid. It is something that is a uh, that is something that we are monitoring. There is obviously, uh, you know, it's a it's it's a quite a very it's quite a difficult security environment on the other side, in Gaza, where aid goes in and where aid workers are working. Uh, but we are doing our best. Thank you. I appreciate that. Gentleman yields. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Allred. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank our uh, witnesses for being here. I want to begin by uh, just reaffirming my support uh, for Israel and condemning in the strongest terms possible uh, Hamas for this unprecedented and barbaric attack on October 7th. I, too, visited a kibbutz in February that was later called by an Israeli general the site of a massacre, uh, and it stays with me. I also want to make clear this is a war with Hamas and not all Palestinians or Muslims generally. Hamas started this war and they have to be held accountable, but we must also do everything we can to limit innocent civilian casualties and provide crucially needed humanitarian aid where we can. And I'd like to connect some of the dots uh, and paint a broader picture for folks who might be watching about the global battle that I see it emerging uh, against autocracy and terrorism that's emerging and that we'll need to rise above our own partisan politics here uh, to effectively combat. The President has requested slightly over $92 billion to help us respond to the war between Israel and Hamas, to support Ukraine, and to support Taiwan. Ambassador Leaf, uh, in this setting, um, what can you share about the growing connection between Hamas and Russia, as well as Russia's increased hostility to Israel? So. Some of that would probably be better in a different setting, uh, Congressman, uh, but I think we're, we're seeing clear evidence of that growing uh, defense relationship, and it's, it's, it's pretty appalling when you think about it. Um, uh, Russia has already clearly developed uh, an arms relationship with Iran, uh, but now they're doing so uh, with, a, with a terrorist organization. So they're really on the wrong side in every possible sense, but I'd be happy to get back to you um, in a classified setting. And I've been in those settings. And can you briefly just maybe ballpark the percentage of, of support that Hamas gets from Iran in terms of their overall budget? I don't have the, those figures uh, offhand. I think it's grown over time, uh, but it's um, but you know you'd also have to count in just uh, lethal aid and training. Uh, uh, there's a whole complex of uh, sort of yeah. support. But that the connection Iran's is provided. pretty well established. Yes, it obviously. is. Uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Stroll, can you? Uh, just tell us about what Iran is providing to Russia in their war against Ukraine. Um, our Defense Intelligence Agency has actually declassified significant amounts of uh, imagery demonstrating that uh, one-way attack, unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, that Russia is using to attack civilians and civilian infrastructure in Ukraine is actually of Iranian origin. So Iran is providing weapons, training, and technical know-how to Russia for its war of choice in Ukraine. Yeah. And can either of you or both of you discuss briefly how Russia and China are helping prop up the Iranian economy? I would have to get back to sure, you okay. with uh, some figures on that. You, I've, I've drawn a blank on that. I've yeah. Okay, that's fine. Well, as, as I see it, what we're dealing with here is the need to respond to an international axis of rogue states, terrorists, and dictators. And this can be seen, of course, as we've discussed, through Iran's support for Hamas and its proxies, along with the Kremlin's warming relations with terrorist organizations like Hamas, Russia's reliance on Iran, as you mentioned, uh, in their war in Ukraine, and Iran's reliance on Russia. That's why we need to pass the supplemental bill, and that's what brings together uh, these overarching conflicts. Uh, Deputy Secretary Schroll, you noted earlier in your testimony the uh, presence of our carrier fleets and the recent arrival of an Ohio-class nuclear sub in the Mediterranean. Uh, my understanding is that nine senior military positions uh, in the command responsible for the Middle East are caught up in the current uh, blockade uh, by a senator uh, of military positions. What impact uh, has that had on our ability to respond to this conflict? Uh, 
what it has done is erode the morale of our military leadership who have been nominated for other positions. We have, uh, for example, our senior defense official in Israel uh, is nominated to be promoted to a one-star uh, representative and has not. Uh, so when at a per precise moment in time, where we would want our best uh, and most senior leadership on the ground working with the Israeli Defense Forces every day, uh, his nomination and promotion is held up by the holds in the Senate. Yeah. Well, I would just note uh, that we are, I think, nine days away from a potential government shutdown. Our new st speaker has chosen to put forward a partisan bill that for the first time conditioned aid uh, to Israel. Uh, when this attack occurred on Israel, we did not have an ambassador in place to Israel, Egypt, Kuwait, Lebanon, or Oman. Our partisan politics are getting in the way of our ability to respond to this crisis and support our allies. And I put forward that we should put that aside to help us deal with this, with this crisis. Thank you for your presence today. Thank you very much, Congressman Cullen Allred. And we now proceed to Congresswoman Young Kim of California. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm glad that uh, we have you here to uh, speak to us as we continue to show our support for Israel. But I am concerned that uh, you know there is an increased attack on U.S. troops by our uh, by the Iran's proxies in Iraq and Syria. And last week, uh, the number of reported injury service members uh, doubled. I want to ask you, was it because there were additional attacks or because initial number of injuries were underreported? Thank you so much, Congresswoman, for that question. Uh, what it indicates is that some of the injuries became more apparent over time. So there was initial monitoring, many of the forces returned to duty and then reported uh, symptoms after, and that is why you saw an increase in the number. Okay. Um, what is your assessment uh, of uh, Houthis' involvement in the war against Iraq, I mean Israel, um, and what is driving their attacks? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman, for that question. It, it, it's a good one. Uh, look, they are, they are, as a movement, very ideologically committed to a sort of death to America, death to the Jews, death to Israel sort of uh, outlook on the world, shall we say. Um, they have thus tried to enter into the fray, um, largely unsuccessfully, uh, thanks to the good efforts of our U.S. military. Can you talk about how that impacts our U.S. national security interest in uh, Red Sea, like freedom of navigation? It's a direct threat. Do you have any thoughts? I agree it's a direct threat. And uh, I would note it's specifically why one of the core U.S. interests in the region is freedom of navigation. And we have been very clear in the last several days about sending the USS Carrier Strike Group Eisenhower through the Suez and through the Red Sea, as well as our, um, the USS Florida, the nuclear guided submarine. Thank you. You know, the Gaza Strip is a notoriously difficult military operating environment, uh, given the defense urban terrain and expensive tunnel network. Still, the IDF has significant combat advantages over Hamas, and they've made substantive progress in the first days of what will likely be a lengthy ground operation. Um, I want to ask you if uh, the administration is prepared to support Israel throughout the duration of its campaign to defeat Hamas. Uh, from President Biden to Secretary Blinken to Secretary Austin and on down the chain, the commitment to Israel's security and having it what it need, get, ensuring that it has what it needs to defend itself from terrorism is ironclad. Okay. You know, there is a bipartisan consensus in Congress that the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps be designated as a terrorist organization by the EU. How is the administration proactively working with our EU allies to accomplish that bipartisan goal? It is a topic of discussion, and uh, we certainly support that. Great, thank you. And I would like to yield the remaining time to my colleague, Mr. Mills. Thank you so much for that. I wanted to follow up. You know, we had a colleague of ours just recently on the other side that was talking about how these ambulances are being struck or these buildings are being struck. And I just wanted to put that in perspective. Of the entire Gaza area, there's about 260,000 structures. Is that correct? 
you've got me. I, I know the sort of the, the general dimensions of the Gaza Strip and the population and so forth. I don't know the exact count on the on, on Well, my buildings. understanding is that of the 260,000 structures, about 9,500 have had any structural damage or have been actually targeted as a result of IDF utilizing it to go after weapon caches or to focus on terror tunnels or to look at areas where key Hamas leadership is. And I just want to paint that perspective because that's only about 3 percent of the entire area, and when you see mainstream media, they try to paint it as if it is an entire demolition of all of Gaza, and it's just a false narrative. The last thing I want to ask is, is are you aware of uh, a gentleman named Sali al Jafarawi? No, I am not. He is a Pollywood actor. Are you aware of Pollywood? So Pollywood is essentially where certain crisis actors, he's a very uh, uh, interesting gentleman because at 25 years old, he's a, apparently a radiologist, a singer, a Hamas fighter, a doctor, and uh, he's actually been killed and was resurrected. Um, so quite an interesting individual. The, the reason I mention this is because he's about as, as, as real as the ghost of Kiev. He has legitimately gone forward and utilizing this misinformation and propaganda warfare is continuing to try and look as if the U.S., the Department of Defense and the IDF is in some way just indiscriminately killing civilians, which we know is to be false. And so just out of uh, the last second I have or so, would you agree that some of the misinformation and propaganda that is being spun up at this time is, in fact, been proven inaccurate, just like the ambulances and others who are, are portraying things that are untrue to try and gain uh, unfavorable outcomes for our, our joint forces? Yes, a good example is the accusation that the IDF is responsible for the al Ahly hospital strike. Thank you so much, and, and I appreciate my colleague lending her time. With that, I yield back. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Kim and Congressman uh, uh, Mills, right. and uh, just grateful. And we now proceed to Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you to our witnesses for being here. Um, you know, I know we've had many conversations in classified settings where we've talked about the military operations on the ground as someone uh, who's Jewish with family living in Israel. This is deeply personal to me and my heart breaks for every Palestinian child who uh, is being killed in this conflict through no fault of their own. Um, I know one of the things that President Biden has emphasized was the lessons that we learned in our own experience after September 11th. You know, I was in middle school, um, and we're still dealing with the consequences that we both, this body and the United States in general, made uh, after that attack. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I think was a key lesson learned was that minimizing civilian harm is incredibly important in the fight against violent extremism. Um, so I was wondering if, if you could share what some of the specific lessons learned in our own fight against terrorism um, that are useful in this situation now and that we've conveyed to the Israeli government. Thank you, Congresswoman, for those, for those questions. Uh, Secretary Austin speaks uh, about lessons learned from the past two decades of the United States military experience. A key lesson is that there is a continuous and consistent need to attend to the needs of the civilian population in order for military gains to be sustainable. I would just add that, you know, that uh, the first trip that Secretary Blinken and I and, and the rest of his team made to Israel uh, fell four or five days after the massacre. And I can only uh, say that the both the, the, but the leadership, the the country, uh, more broadly, but the leadership was in a state of shock, um, and and deep trauma, and that trauma is still there. Um, I think uh, part of what we have seen uh, our job to be, both on the civilian side and the military side, is uh, is to be uh, a strong shoulder to lean on and help uh, nation in trauma and shock and its leadership move through that um, as they made um, decisions about uh, the military campaign and so forth. So there's been a good, robust soldier-to-soldier uh, -soldier discussion about this, and of course, um, our, our own leadership is engaged in that. Um, but the, the president spoke from his heart when he said that, and he spoke as a friend um, that learned from us because we did make uh, some very um, grave uh, decisions, uh, grave mistakes, rather, 
uh, early on and through that continuous fight against um, uh, you know the terrorist uh, scourge that come to our shores. Well, thank you. And I know the Israelis themselves have openly said that many of the uh, provisions we've seen around food and water and humanitarian assistance have been directly because of the advocacy of the U.S. government. So I thank you for, for all of your tireless work on that. And I, I know that Prime Minister Netanyahu has said that he is not willing to do a humanitarian pause. And I appreciate all of the work you all have been doing to, to continue encouraging him to make sure that we are able to get that uh, assistance. I want to move to our, our U.S. forces in the region. Um, obviously, we've repositioned significant military resources to deter this from uh, expanding, uh, and especially from Hezbollah and Iran from further intervening. Um, can you commit to us that you will come to Congress before conducting combat operations or other hostilities against a belligerent in this unfolding conflict, especially any hostilities that could escalate? If, if Congresswoman, you are referencing anything other than the self-defense strikes that President Biden has under ordered under his Article II authority, yes, we would consult with Congress. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and lastly, uh, I want to ask, um, there's been public reporting uh, about uh, the U.S. approving the sale of uh, military-style weapons for the Israeli National Police. Uh, the Israeli National Police obviously are under the purview of uh, Minister Ben Gavir, one of the far-right extremists. Um, we've also uh, seen concerns that some of those weapons, in addition to being used by the National Police themselves in ways that are um, probably not necessarily aligned with what we would want uh, policing to be, also have been given directly to settlers who are engaging in settler violence. What assurances can you give us about whether or not those weapons are actually being approved and uh, whether or not um, they will be used for things that I think we all would agree uh, we don't approve of? Thank you. Um, Congressman, thank you for that. Um, in all of these cases, we have um, been provided assurances um, and we have rigorous oversight or end use uh, uh, monitoring for all of this. Uh, there were uh, wep uh, weapons that will be provided to what are called community immediate response teams, CERT, that report directly to regional police or border patro uh, patrol commanders. They will, and they supervise the use of those and those, uh, and, and to the personnel who are <coughs> volunteers for these organizations, and it is only within Green Line uh, Israel, but we have a, an elaborate set of assurances on that. So at least time has expired. Uh, I'd like to, if I may, just quickly follow up on a point that Ms. Uh, Jacobs made on the uh, use of military force. You know, this committee is charged with that responsibility, and we take that very seriously. Um, I understand you're using Article II self-defense when it comes to our troops being under fire and attack, and I get that. Um, if, if the administration were to respond either preemptively to the IRGC or to Hezbollah or to Hamas, do you believe that, that you would have to come before this committee for that authorization? If we were responding to an attack in self-defense, then we would rely on the president's article to authority. If we were taking action that uh, would elevate to war in the constitutional sense, we would consult with Congress and seek authorization for the use of military force. If, say, hypothetically, Hezbollah launched 100,000 rockets into Israel and we wanted to respond, I, I would argue you do not have authorization to hit Hamas. I would agree with you, Jim. And same with, uh, not Hamas, I mean Hezbollah. And probably the same with Hamas in that, in that situation. If the United States, uh, if, if President Biden wanted to... Uh, to work with Israel to respond should Hezbollah decide to launch that amount of rockets into Israel, we would certainly come consult with Congress. Thank you. And I, I, think, I think we're all in agreement on that. So thank you very much. Uh, Chair now recognizes Ms. Salazar. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And thank you, Ms. Uh, Assistant Secretary Barbara Leaf for your service and uh, Mrs. Dana Stroll for being here and answering our questions. You know, I represent the city of Miami. Uh, the chairman of the subcommittee on the Western Hemisphere. And I have a few questions to you about Colombia and Cuba. This picture over here shows the Cuban ambassador to Lebanon. His name is Jorge Leon Cruz. 
meeting with Ahmed Abdel Hadid, who was the Hamas representative in Lebanon, and with Abdul Hamed, who is the head of political and media relations for Hamas in Lebanon. So to cut right to the chase, what do you think could be the purpose of this meeting? Why is the Cuban ambassador meeting with a representative of, us, of such high uh, standing for Hamas in Lebanon? Congresswoman, it doesn't look good to me. I can't imagine what, um, what uh, legitimate purpose there would be in meeting with a terrorist organization's representative. So I, I agree with you that I'm sure that nothing good is coming out of this meeting. The only thing we could think of is that maybe uh, the Cuban regime is inviting some Hamas operatives to come to Havana, which is Havana is only 90 miles away from my house, meaning my community, the city of Miami. Do you have any info about that? I do not personally, but I'd be happy to look into it and come back to you on it. Please do. Cuba is in the list of countries that sponsor terrorism. And uh, we know that the Biden administration has been thinking, or some of the, uh, um, some of the representatives of the Biden administration, has, they have been, within the State Department, they have been talking about the possibility of removing Cuba from that list of states that sponsor terrorism. Uh, could you send the message to your colleagues that maybe after something like this, uh, Cuba should remain on that list? I'd be happy to take that back. And what do you think about that? Um, uh, quite frankly, I have not been following this issue in terms of Cuba, so I, you know, I don't have an opinion on it, but I'd be happy to take this back to my colleagues. All right. Um, now let's go to Colombia. Let me go to the other one. Uh, Petro, the president of Colombia, uh, has been, throughout his uh, time in, in office, he has been talking about Hamas, and one of the comments, and I'm just being uh, pretty rigorous, he compared the Jews to the Nazis at one point. A few days ago, President Petro compared Gaza to Auschwitz. A few weeks ago, he recalled the Colombian ambassador in Israel. So the question is, how does the State Department categorize, interpret these comments, actions from the Colombian president? Well, I, I can speak to it here um, in, in the sense that this is obviously uh, an appalling set of comparisons, um, you know, uh, misusing, the, 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 misusing the notion of the Holocaust to compare it to what is going on right now is, is really um, beyond the pale. You know, the State Department has treated the president of Colombia with a lot of deference, and so has the White House. So I just want to hear your comments and your opinions. What would you be send, sending back? What message would you be sending back to the State Department, to the rest of the State Department, and to the White House about uh, the actions and the words of the actual president of Colombia? Well, this is the first I've, I've been made aware of this, Congresswoman, and I am happy to take this back. But, you know, I think that the State Department should be, and someone in your position should be aware and knowledgeable of what's happening in our backyard. Well, you know, um, uh, for better or worse, I have a I have a remit in the Middle East that keeps me busy 24/7. So it's been a little bit difficult, especially these days, to look beyond to um, uh, the kind of dialogue or the kind. And of I understand discourse. that your job is 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 very big, but I'm very happy that I have brought to your attention the fact that these two countries that are very close to us in our hemisphere are behaving or acting this way or speaking this way. Now, that's the last question. How concerning is it to the State Department that these two governments, Cuba and uh, Colombia, in our backyard, 90 miles away from Miami, uh, specifically the Cuban government is inviting, I'm sure inviting uh, Hamas operatives uh, to our hemisphere. How concerning? I would certainly be concerned if they were inviting Hamas operatives to our hemisphere, and that's certainly something we'll look into it. And I would like for you very much to get back to us and tell us if you have any type of information, if any Hamas personnel or combatants have crossed to this hemisphere, meaning invited to Havana or to more to Havana than probably any other country. Could I count on that? You can count on that. Thank you, madam. I yield back. Chair, lady yields. Uh, chair recognizes Ms. Manning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Meeks, and thank you to our witnesses today. 
On October 7th, we woke in horror to Hamas's brutal and despicable terror attacks as they fired rockets at innocent civilians, stormed the border and invaded Israel, going house to house, murdering babies, executing parents in front of their children, massacring 260 young people at a music festival, and murdering more than 1,400 innocent people on one terrible day. In addition, Hamas took more than 240 innocent civilians hostage, including elderly women, young children, and babies. I have beside me pictures of some of these men, women, and children. I would like to ask everyone to look at their faces. Each one of them is a precious individual who has family members who love them and are desperate to know if they are safe and desperate for their return. I have met with the families of hostages for the past three weeks. People like the Siegel family from North Carolina, whose relatives Keith and Aviva Siegel were kidnapped from Kibbutz Kafar Aza. People like Gili Rahman, whose sister Yarden handed her three-year-old daughter Geffen to her husband Alan while they were trying to escape because he could run faster while she sacrificed herself to save her daughter and Abigail Moore Idan, who became an orphan on October 7th when her parents were killed in front of her before she was taken hostage alone. Just like the stories of the Holocaust survivors, the story of every hostage is unique and heartbreaking. I have given these families my word that I would continue to tell their stories and push the administration to do everything they can to secure their release. So I know Assistant Secretary Leaf and Deputy Assistant Secretary Struhl, you can give them hope that we will spare no effort to secure their release. I believe you've said that before today. I just want to ask you that question again. Of course, um, you absolutely have the commitment of this administration to do everything in its power to see the release of those hostages. It is one of the reasons why the Department of Defense immediately sent advisors to support efforts to secure the release of the hostages. Thank you so much. And Assistant Secretary Leaf, we know that the International Committee of the Red Cross has not been let in to see the hostages, to make sure that they are alive and to, to be able to give word to their families. What are the barriers to allowing the Red Cross to get in to see the hostages? One word, Hamas. So Hamas is preventing the International Red Cross from going in to see the hostages and give their families some hope that those people are still alive. And in fact, the only reason we know some of them are alive because of the comments of the five hostages, four hostages who have been released and one who has been saved by Israeli soldiers. Is that correct? Well, there is also the really deplorable fact that Hamas has um, put some of the hostages on video and televised that. So yeah, it is, it is really a dreadful situation for the families and for their loved ones. Um, and um, by all rights, by the laws, international humanitarian law, Hamas should allow I, the ICRC to have access to those uh, hostages. And can you, what information can you share with us in this setting about what the U.S. is doing to get our partners and allies in the region to demand and put pressure on Hamas to release the hostages? So, uh, as I indicated earlier, we have two uh, stalwart partners, Qatar and Egypt, who are working um, methodically, relentlessly at this issue. Um, they have, uh, the problem is who they're dealing with. Uh, but they are exercising every bit of the, their influence um, and their energy to try to break the impasse um, on, uh, this, on the hostages. And, and Assistant Secretary Leaf, in your opinion, uh, are you satisfied with the actions that Turkey, a NATO ally, and Qatar, a major non-NATO NATO ally, have taken so far to get Hamas to give up American citizens? I have not really seen Turkey engaged in this effort. I, um, if they are, I'm, I'm just not witting to it. But I know, having talked um, uh, just very regularly with the um, uh, Prime Minister, Foreign Minister, that he is personally engaged in the effort uh, of Qatar. He's personally engaged in the effort. He has a large team working it 24-7. 
Thank you. My time is expiring. I yield back. Gentlelady yields. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Heisinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, actually, I'm going to I'm going to take that as a jumping off uh, point. Both uh, the ICRC as well as uh, 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 Cutter uh, and the situation there. First on the I, I, uh, ICRC, is the ICRC doing enough? Uh, there is some some question. Uh, it's uh, it's real commitment, and, and and all you have to do is look at some of the previous years and decades. Uh, ICRC seems to have been pretty pretty hard on Israel uh, over the years, um, and some have suggested that the ICRC is not doing enough uh, to to pursue this because of that. Uh, relationship or sort of bad blood with uh, with Israel. You care to comment on that, Congressman? I have no reason to think uh, the ICRC is not uh, doing enough on this, and and I would just add that in fact, um, ICRC staff have been in uh, in the direct line of fire in Gaza, doing a really critical piece of work, which is escorting uh, ambulances with wounded uh, from Gaza to Rafa. This has been a condition that Hamas has placed on the exit of foreign nationals, including our own American citizens. And ICRC stepped up to that task to ensure that they got there and that our uh, citizens could get out. Okay. Um, and we can explore that uh, more uh, potentially later. Um, uh, turning to uh, Qatar and, and the uh, sort of the reports of Hamas uh, leaders living of, of Pretty lavish lifestyle in in uh, in the country. Um, it, obviously, we have a very important relationship uh, with, uh, with with Qatar, and and uh, they host thousands of our, our of our troops. Central Command, um, regional Central Command is there. Um, what sort of conversations has the administration had uh, with Qatar to uh, kick out Hamas terrorists currently residing in the country? Um, uh, and, and, and really making sure that they are ensuring that they're not providing Hamas with uh, any of the, uh, the, the means to, uh, to, to fund this again. You know, you make an interesting point, and it, and it really goes to this question of what Hamas thinks it's representing or doing. Uh, its leaders do live the, uh, in the lap of luxury overseas, um, quite in uh, contrast to the Palestinians in Gaza over whom they rule. Uh, to your question, at this point, Qatar, um, at our request, at, at, at the, Israel's request, is working assiduously on the issue of hostage release. Um, but it, it's fair to say that we've, we've been clear with um, all of our partners and, and countries around the world that it will, um, it will not be back to business as usual going forward. Okay. Um, I, uh, I ha actually happened to also serve on the Financial Services Committee and chair the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee. And just last week we had a, a hearing um, on uh, terrorism financing and, uh, and, and what was going on. And uh, my colleague, Mr. Hill, uh, myself, Mr. Barr, have all had amendments today uh, on, uh, uh, on some of the appropriations uh, bills looking at how we choke off uh, that, uh, that terrorism funding. And I guess I want to make sure that, that uh, it's not just Iran that we're looking at, that there are other countries in, in, uh, in, that, in that neighborhood. Um, obviously, you know, Qatar has, has, has I see, I've seen reports have provided over a billion dollars in various aid over the last decade. Lots of concern about fungibility uh, that, uh, that we have. So uh, how is the administration ensuring that assistance entering Gaza doesn't have sort of this dual purpose, uh, dual use purpose, whether it could be cash, which is very, very fungible, uh, but it could be fuel, it could be medicine and supplies that uh, while the West intends or the Red Cross or anybody else intends for that to be going to civilians could be easily diverted. At this point, the, 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 what is going into Gaza, the, the humanitarian assistance is being very carefully um, um, vetted as it goes through, through multiple sort of um, checks. Uh, this is part of what is slowed down, frankly, the, the, the stream of assistance going in. Um, I take your point on the larger question of, of financing. And believe me when I say that um, a, a sort of a counter Hamas um, effort globally will be a top priority yeah. going forward. Um, I've got just a couple of seconds left. Um, you know, we, we know about 
uh, Iran's oil sales uh, to the tune, some reports of $80 billion <coughs> in the past year. Uh, we also know that they are purchasing, or some sorry, selling electricity to Iraq. Uh, I have uh, had a letter to Secretary Blinken uh, with myself and uh, Blaine Lukemeyer, who uh, heads up the Terrorism Finance Subcommittee um, for, uh, for Financial Services, uh, asking some very specific questions. Are you aware of this letter? I'm not. I'll certainly look for it. Uh, we will send it to you uh, because this is, uh, this is very important that we, we look at this. The, this notion that Iraq is, has the ability, and this administration changed policy on this without coming to Congress, they are now converting those into euros. Euros are far more fungible than Iraqi denarii. Uh, it, it, nobody, nobody's going to be buying and selling goods and services in, in that. They are certainly in, in, uh, in euros. And uh, we're going to continue to push on this, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I know my time is up, but I appreciate the responsiveness. And we're going to be following up with you on the, some of those issues. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. Time has expired. Uh, Chair recognizes Ms. Dean. Thank you, Chairman McCall and uh, Ranking Member Meeks for this important hearing. I thank both of uh, you uh, women for testifying today. More important, I thank you for your service and your clarity of purpose at this extraordinarily challenging time. As all of us have said, it's been uh, just a little more than a month since the grotesque, brutal slaughter of more than 1,400 uh, Israelis uh, as a mom and a grandma, the worst, uh, uh, the children, the babies. Um, uh, but men, women, and children uh, butchered, slaughtered, raped, more than 200 uh, hostages, 240 plus, apparently. We all. I think, I hope, unequivocally condemn the October 7th attack by Hamas, uh, a terrorist organization. Uh, I condemn Hamas. Uh, I know Israel has the right, the responsibility uh, to respond uh, and to dismantle Hamas terrorism. Uh, we have to ensure the safe return of the hostages, and I was appreciative of Representative Manning's line of questions. Do you have any at all possible update on the hostages at this moment? I wouldn't want to jeopardize the efforts that are underway by commenting on it publicly. I appreciate that. And I just felt I had to ask, but I understand that sensitivity. Um, at the same time, we have to do everything uh, to make sure to protect innocent civilian lines on both sides of the fence. Uh, and so uh, I decry. Uh, the loss of life, the loss of innocent civilian life uh, in Gaza. I've called on uh, the administration to do everything in their power, and I'm very proud of the president as well as the Secretary of State for the extraordinary work they're doing. Um, but we must seek, Israel must uh, seek a humanitarian pause um, for all kinds of reasons to get the hostages out and to make sure that folks are taken care of as best as possible in these extraordinarily uh, difficult um, situations. There are moral choices in wars. It is not just you have a right to be at war. There are moral choices, and I, I want the administration to continue to lift up innocent life. Dead babies on either side of the fence are unacceptable uh, to, to me, at least. Uh, we've talked a lot about Gaza. I wonder if I could switch a little bit to the West Bank. Uh, I've been to Israel. I've been to the West Bank. I've been to Gaza. Um, uh, Ambassador Leaf, you expressed concern about the st stability of the West Bank. I'm concerned, too. You note the urgency of reining in extremist settler violence. I am concerned about that, too, which uh, I quote, which has led to the displacement of at least 828 Palestinians from their homes and 15 different communities in the West Bank since October 7th. You point out that even before the start of the latest crisis, there were set settler violence attacks day after day, multiple attacks in a single day, 1,400 incidents um, from January to October of this year. Uh, Ambassador, uh, how are you and Secretary Blinken and the administration engaging with Israel, uh, specifically the coalition administration, to prevent further settler violence? When I was on the ground there, uh, uh, the meeting, this was uh, prior to October 7th, the meeting when we asked about settler violence was shut down. What are you doing? Um, this has been a topic of uh, discussion between us and the Israeli government for months, literally. 
Uh, what has really accelerated our efforts has been the phenomenal, uh, really terrible 500% uh, increase in these attacks, sometimes several dozen a day. Um, they're, they're also more violent. Um, you know, beatings and uh, destruction of property. Um, some Palestinians have been killed by settlers. Yes. Um, and Quite a uh, few. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, and destruction of property that is aimed really at uh, wholly damaging, destroying the, the economy, the livelihoods of uh, these communities. So we have been relentlessly on this issue, and I would say uh, there has been uh, a belated but welcome uh, sort of uh, awakening uh, to the alarming trend lines, um, awakening in the senior leaders of uh, among the senior leaders of the of the coalition, um, and they have committed to us to pursue, to deter, to prevent these activities, and to bring to accountability those who engage in them, whether they are members of the armed forces, the IDF, or settlers themselves. Yeah. Um, and so, as uh, Secretary Blinken said uh, several days ago when he had this uh, engagement with uh, the, the government, um, he heard the right thing, but we're gonna follow this in detail and we want to see accountability. Okay, and I apologize, my time has expired, but I'm going to offer in writing some questions for you as well. So I thank you both very much, I yield back. The way yields, uh, Chair now recognizes Mr. Hill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, ladies, for being here and for your testimony. Thanks for hanging out for this <laughs> extended period of time. Uh, Secretary Leaf, great to see you. I feel like we're past ships passing in the night. I go in an embassy, you've just left, or go in a ministry, you've just left. So thanks for the incredible engagement you've had in the region this year, and I know it's paid off now that we're in a crisis mode. No, but I mean, having been so deeply engaged all year, we're now in a crisis mode. I think those hours pay off. My office has been in contact with a constituent uh, from central Arkansas whose uh, wife and two young kids, six months and two years uh, in Gaza, and they're in touch with the embassy. The State Department has all their information. The State Department's, you know, done a reasonable job staying in touch with them, so I'm not on the the complaint factor there. But the situation at Rafa border crossing has been really tenuous. What's your plan to get the Rafa border crossing open so Americans who are stuck in Gaza can have more predictability about getting out? So, uh, Congressman, this is an issue w that we are just working nonstop. Um, nobody is more dedicated to this task uh, than Ambassador Satterfield and his whole team. Uh, the, the complexity of the task has been that uh, essentially Hamas has a condition uh, flow, outflow of uh, foreign nationals on um, a steady stream of wounded being taken through the Rafa crossing. That has required a really meticulous scrubbing of those lists to make sure there are no fighters who are among the wounded. Uh, very careful calibration between Israel and Egypt to ensure that it, sometimes there, are, there is fighting in the vicinity, uh, sometimes the comms are down. Um, so we have compiled a list um, of, uh, I think, about 700 uh, such constituents uh, or American citizens and their families, and we're working at metering them through day after day. Thanks. Well, I think it's tough. The, the woman who's my constituent is a Palestinian passport. She's a U.S. green card holder and her two kids. I mean, six months and two years. The kids get on the list, but the parent doesn't. I mean, that's ridiculous. No, um, and actually what is happening is uh, sometimes families will be on different lists, but we have yeah. a, a consular team on the other side, and we are putting people together. When Good. They get through. That's really important, I think, and it's a, it's a daily uh, drama for many members who are helping Americans because they find their names are not on the list and we get the call right after that. So thank you for your, your diligence. Uh, this year the House uh, NDAA included Mona by amendments to report uh, to the uh, USG on Iran's uh, threats against the United States, our allies uh, in the Middle East. And in follow-up to your conversation with Chairman McCall, I mean clearly Iran backs uh, these proxies and, uh, but in testimony here, the State Department said they would not recommend that uh, Shia militia, for example, be on a future modification of the AUMF. You think state still stands by that? DOD still stand by not including Shia militia or Hezbollah on, on an AUMF? Yes, we still do not support including Iran-aligned militia groups on the 2001 AUMF, which was specifically geared towards non-state actors. Our uh, objective is to de-escalate in the region and prevent regional war. Yep. 
Well, uh, I'll ask you how that's working. Uh, not so good. I think uh, I think they've ramped up this effort, and uh, uh, everything that we thought might come true over the few years is absolutely coming true. Between Houthis shooting cruise missiles over Saudi Arabia at, you, at Israel, this is this is why I think we have to take a much tougher stand uh, towards Iran and Iran-backed uh, militia. Um, Normalization, Secretary Leaf, this is one you know my feelings about the Assad regime. And again, uh, the Arab League went forward. You cautioned on that. Secretary Blinken, much even more aggressive than you, public and in private, about absolutely not doing it. But they've done it. So have you seen uh, anything that's uh, remotely uh, on track for Assad becoming suddenly such a good member of the local community? No, but on the other hand, um, if he thought he was going to reap great benefits, he has not done so. True, so, um, true. But what do you make of the foreign minister's uh, group that is not going to report for a whole other year on their recommendations on what the Assad regime might do in order to earn such benefits? Uh, I think it speaks to uh, the lack of results um, uh, wholly exclusively because of uh, Syrian intransigence. Yeah. It's a dead end. Uh, I, I think it is, too, and I've made that, I've certainly expressed that view, personal view, not on behalf of anybody but myself, to Saudi Arabia and to in Jordan and in Iraq. Um, there's a real mixed view on that, and I hope that the United States will speak with one voice that normalization was a bad idea and that we're monitoring very closely how we can help get those results now that they've done it. I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, yields, I, I, correct. I, I think that may have been a, a trigger for this uh, Hamas invasion of Israel, to be honest with you. Uh, in addition to being the 50-year anniversary of Yom Kippur. Uh, Chair now recognizes Mr. Stanton. Thank you very much, Chairman McCall and Ranking Member Meeks, for convening this important hearing on support for one of our nation's strongest allies, Israel. And I want to thank the witnesses for being here today for this, uh, their long testimony. Recently, I've had honest and emotional conversations with my constituents in Arizona, people I have known and respected and worked with for decades. And I've heard the deep divisions, as well as the fear created by the tragic rise in anti-Semitism and Islamophobia here in the United States. As Americans, we can freely debate many contentious issues, but we cannot allow that to turn into hatred. Since its founding 75 years ago, America's support for the only democracy in the Middle East has been resolute and unwavering and always always bipartisan. That cannot and will not change. But the reality is that Israel cannot be secure and there can be no lasting peace for Israelis or Palestinians, no two states side by side, until Hamas is destroyed. Hamas does not care about the Palestinian people. They care about one thing, the complete destruction and elimination of Israel from the river to the sea. In pursuit of that goal, Hamas has preyed on innocent Palestinians. Hamas doesn't hide it. Its leaders talk about their willingness to make Palestinian civilians martyrs in their wicked mission. And right now, Hamas is holding 240 women, children, grandparents, Holocaust survivors hostage in unknowable conditions, hostages they have threatened to execute. There can be no safe harbor for Hamas, and Congress must act unequivocally in support of Israel in this fight. Now, I'm a proud supporter of Israel. I always will be. Yet I'm also a supporter of the Palestinian people. I support a Palestinian state, and I believe that every Palestinian has a God-given right to a more prosperous future. The United States has been one of the best humanitarian partners for the Palestinian people for decades, sending billions of dollars into the West Bank and Gaza. And I'm grateful that President Biden restored U.S. assistance to the Palestinian people after President Trump had ended it. Today, we should do everything we can to get aid to those in Gaza who need it the most, including food and clean water, medical care, fuel, and shelter. History has reminded us time and time again of the importance of a Jewish state. We must protect it, not only because it is the right thing to do, but because Israel's security is tied to America's national security. 
Shared Israeli intelligence boosts our own government's ability to anticipate and respond to threats in the Middle East. And Israel's qualitative military edge provides a measure of stability in this region. This Congress needs to quickly pass a national security funding package that mirrors the President's full request, one that includes humanitarian aid to Gaza, additional aid to our ally Ukraine, and funds to secure our southern border. And I will work across the aisle to get this done. I have a question for Assistant Sec Secretary Leaf. Thank you for answering Ranking Member Meek's earlier question about the future administration of Gaza. It's something that I'm particularly worried about as well. You said that, quote, the Palestinian Authority is the appropriate place to look for governance, unquote. In your opinion, what is the most realistic scenario of what a Palestinian Authority governance would look like in Gaza? So, you know, this is a profoundly difficult question to answer at the moment. We're doing a lot of uh, analysis and, and, and looking at the question holistically. Um, the Palestinian Authority, <clears throat> as you know, has, has only partial responsibilities in the West Bank. It does not govern the entire space, and it doesn't have equal measures of, of responsibilities in areas A, B, and C. Um, what will be, um, what we'll, we'll see in terms of security conditions within Gaza um, if Israel is successful, or depending on the degree of success that Israel has in, remo in, in uh, incapacitating the military uh, capabilities of Hamas, will we'll go directly to um, who and how um, uh, manages that. So I would, you know, we're just at the front end of looking at that. I can't really tell Thank you, you um, whether the PA is fit to purpose to go in immediately. Probably not. And so we will no. consult. Uh, thoroughly with both Israel and the Palestinians as we uh, think through this prospect. All right. I have additional questions that I will submit in writing for the record, including uh, how the Department of Defense will accelerate delivery of security assistance to, to Israel, including Iron Dome and scepters and other weaponry. But with that, I will yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Congressman Stanton. We now proceed to Congressman Jim Baird of Indiana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Meeks, and I appreciate the witnesses being here. Uh, very much. And so uh, my question relates to this background. The United Nations Relief and Works Agency for the Palestinian Refugees in the Near East, and UNRWA for short, as I'm sure you know, is a UN agency tasked with according uh, to their mandate, and I quote, to carry out and direct relief works programs for Palestinian refugees and their descendants. The UNRWA General Counsel, James Lindsay, candidly admits, quote, oh, I am sure that there are Hamas members on the UNRWA payroll, and I don't see that as a crime. He also states, and I quote, UNRWA has taken very few steps to detect and eliminate terrorists from the ranks of its staff or its beneficiaries and no steps at all to prevent members of organizations such as Hamas from joining its staff. The largest contributor to UNRWA is the United States. In times of crisis, like the ongoing Israeli conflict, the UNRWA can receive emergency funding for response projects. So my question, is, my first question is, has the UN released any emergency funding to UNRWA since October 7th? Has the UN released uh, funding to UNRWA since? Yes. I, I don't have those exact figures, but uh, there is an emergency appeal underway. So in con continuing with that thought, uh, so how many U.S. taxpayer dollars have been authorized to UNRWA, and how much of that money has been funneled to Hamas? Uh, we, uh, we, I think, provided something on the order of $300 million this year. Uh, those monies go to, uh, to provision of critical services to Palestinians across the region, Syria, Lebanon, Gaza, West Bank, and Jordan. Um, and right now, much of UNRWA's attention is focused on the really critical uh, life-saving support that it provides in Gaza to the Palestinians uh, there. Um, 
I'm not aware of any such monies being diverted to Hamas. We have rigorous oversight of, uh, of these matters, as does, uh, as does UNRWA. So in your opinion, uh, should the United States continue to fund UNRWA, and if so, why? UNRWA provides, uh, ir it provides uh, plays an irreplaceable role in Gaza, especially at this time, Congressman. Uh, there is literally, they, they have the uh, infrastructure and the personnel on the ground to reach Palestinians in need and distress in harm's way. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Strell, do you have any comments in that regard in terms of? Broadly speaking, the Department of Defense uh, believes that delivery of humanitarian aid to civilians in need in Gaza is both a moral, operational, and strategic imperative, and we support the Department of State. Let me change. Uh, in March of this year, the Middle East Subcommittee held a hearing on the efforts to expand the Abraham Accords. Talking about it then, it was more focused on how we can work to expand the accords. And now the question seems to be, is it even feasible? So uh, Assistant Secretary Leaf, can you uh, give us your opinion about how this war plays a role in the Abraham Accords? Well, uh, Congressman, I, I, I'll be very candid with you. The, the atmosphere in the region is fraught at this point over the conflict and, and the, 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 the visuals, the, the, da the, the daily toll of casualties among Palestinians uh, in, in the Gaza Strip. And as a number of Congress uh, uh, representatives have, have noted, there's a great polarization occurring both in the region and, and, and even we see that in our own streets. Um, all that said, um, there is, uh, there, there will be an end to this conflict and there will be a lot of work to do on the other side of this conflict. Of course, between, uh, the work between uh, the parties, Israelis and Palestinians, but more broadly across the region and that goes squarely to your interests, which is the Abraham Accords relationships, uh, the, the older relationships Egypt and Jordan have, uh, have had with Israel and those uh, still in the offing. Uh, we regard this as one of the critical pieces of our work, of our diplomatic work in the period ahead, post-conflict. So I see I'm out of time, and I thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Congressman Baird. We now proceed to Congressman Jonathan Jackson of Illinois and South Carolina. All right. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Undersecretaries. Thank you. His absence, Chairman McCall, thank you, Ranking Member Meeks. I've had the pleasure once again to go to Israel this past September on a delegation with the Congressional Black Caucus. And from there, we went to Rwanda, um, and they were showing the connectivity of one culture that ex had experienced genocide and the other that had experienced the Holocaust and the commonality. I, like many of my colleagues, have condemned the atrocious attacks, the terrorist attacks of Hamas and stand by that. I was one of the several of the people that stood for a ceasefire. And I want to be clear, what ceasefire means to me is first of all, bringing back our hostages, reconciling human beings, reconciling family members. As we speak, I got another call today. There's another constituent that has a sister that is stuck at the Rafa border that needs to get out, an American citizen that is um, stuck at the border as well. So one question I will ask you is about uh, following on what Mr. French Hill had discussed on what is the process? How can we make sure Americans are able to evacuate and leave there without their lives being threatened? Uh, so we have um, exhaustive outreach to Americans in Gaza. Um, we have determined just over the last 24 hours that there were an additional 100 Americans and their family members who were seeking um, uh, help in getting out. We have put American citizens and their family members on lists um, that um, are shared with the Egyptian government in Israel so that there is an ability to get them in the queue, as it were, it is, um, it is a difficult process to, from day, from, from literally day to day, to see, uh, to confirm the number that will be permitted through 
and to reach out to those who are not all queued up at, at Rafa. They are in different places in Gaza. But I'd be happy to talk to you after this hearing about uh, your constituent. I'd be glad to. Second part is one of the things that I had learned on this trip that was sponsored by APAC, we went from Israel to Rwanda, is that Rwanda in 1993 had suffered a million lives lost in 100 days. And then they lost 5 million people there in the DRC in 2003. They ended up arresting 30,000 people that went to jail for the atrocities that happened. What ceasefire meant to me is that we can acknowledge this was an intelligence failure by the IDF that ended up creating so much of this. I am strong for defense. Israel needs its defense. I'm also for diplomacy when this bombing in retaliation took place 30 days ago. It was taken without a confirmed ambassador to the United States or without a confirmed ambassador from the United States to Israel or to Egypt. I didn't think we had all of our, all of our diplomacy in place. And then what gives for a long-lasting peace so that we can have reconciliation amongst the people that I'm seeing people become hardened. I live in a district where the six-year-old child was stabbed to death. People are being, becoming radicalized, and we have seen this escalate over time. I am asking for a ceasefire simply to get humanitarian aid in. If there's one innocent person killed, to me that's too many. If it takes more time to ultimately root out Hamas and so that we do not kill innocent people, I am for that. Ultimately what happened is a lesson that we saw in Afghanistan, if we've learned anything, after two trillion dollars bombing Afghanistan, is that um, Osama bin Laden was in Afghan was in Pakistan, across from a military base, watching Netflix or Hulu uh, in a compound with a family. He wasn't even in the country. So, I would like to ask you, what is the long-term path towards peace that we are administering now in pursuit of Hamas and to reconcile these people? and not making the Palestinian people feel as if they are our enemy. An excellent question, Congressman. Look, the long-term uh, effort is something that we are already <laughs> beginning to communicate um, um, and, and, and base our diplomacy on even now. There is the urgent, uh, you know, issues of humanitarian assistance, uh, assisting civilians to get out of harm's way, getting our own personnel, our own citizens out of Gaza, the hostages released. But even as we work on the urgent issues of today, we're, we are planning for uh, the, the post-conflict period when it is clear, it is indisputably clear to us, to the administration, to all of our partners in the region, uh, that the Palestinian quest for statehood must be answered. We must, we must contribute, we must uh, lay out a pathway for a negotiated solution to that end. They have a right to a state uh, that has been recognized by uh, multiple administrations over decades, uh, and that quest uh, must be answered less radicalization, really derail it uh, once and for all. Uh, Hamas is determined to weaponize this cause, and that is something that we must work urgently to prevent. Um, I take your point on a ceasefire. I would just say that we are working assiduously for humanitarian pauses that will get at just the things that you're talking about. Um, a ceasefire, when it comes, or an end to hostilities, when it comes, uh, we want to see uh, really a you know an end to Hamas's ability to operate as it has in the past, terror, uh, ruling by terror, by fiat, uh, but also uh, perpetrating attack uh, that really can, uh, we must never let, uh, let be repeated. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Congressman Jackson. We now proceed to Congressman Keith South of Texas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm trying to reconcile some things that I've heard uh, today and um, that Hamas leadership has said. Wait a minute. Before I get to that, uh, we just uh, struck IRGC affiliates again in Syria today, uh, apparently within a couple of hours. Uh, why does the Biden administration refuse to put Iran surrogates on any AUMF? How can you continue to do that? Because I've heard you say, use the word de-escalate de here. 
Uh, this region, after service in the military in Egypt, Israel, Afghanistan, and Qatar, uh, this region understands one thing, it's power. If we're going to deter, we must have the power in hitting empty or even storage sites that may not be empty do not seem to me to be deterrence. Uh, why does the administration refuse to put Iranian surrogates on the, any AUMF? How can you justify that given the way this is moving? Thank you for your question. I can confirm that uh, about an hour ago, the U.S. conducted self-defense strikes in response to recent attacks against U.S. forces in eastern Syria. We look forward to providing further details to you soon. Um, to, to be very clear, Iran is the origin and has the fingerprints of the arming, training, equipping, and directing of these militia groups. Uh, putting Iran-aligned militia groups is uh, declaring war on Iran. Our objective in the region is to prevent war, to prevent escalation. Wait a minute. Did, you, a just, did you just say that putting them on an AUMF is declaring war on Iran? It is, it is requesting the authorization to use military force against Iran-aligned militia groups. The president has directed self-defense self -defense strikes under his Article II authority. Our approach to deterring Iran is both the significant increases in U.S. defense posture combined with the demonstrated willingness to use force and self-defense as well as robust diplomacy and other tools to compel the senior leadership of Iran to direct its proxies okay. to stop attacking U.S. forces. Let me do a comparison. Under the last administration, uh, one contractor was killed. In turn, we deterred successfully Iran by killing, I believe, the number three man in the Iranian hierarchy. Is that correct? Number three, Suleimani? About that? It is a fact that in the previous administration, there was a strike on Suleimani. Correct. And so under this administration, we've had, what, 40 attacks in the recent uh, weeks, 40 attacks maybe uh, in that order, of that order. And so we've hit uh, ammunition dumps, weapons storage sites twice now, correct? President Biden directed self-defense strikes against facilities in eastern Syria affiliated with and known to be used by the IRGC. Right. I, okay, I want to go to my uh, main line of questioning. We've got a minute and a half. Do you know where Ismail Aniya is in Qatar? Do you know where he lives? Does Qatar I know? Uh, yes, he, uh, yes, of course, uh, they speak with him. Uh, and why does Qatar allow him movement to Iran and back in the last few days? And, and also, why did they allow Iranian hierarchy to come visit him in Qatar? Why is that? I, I can't, <clears throat> excuse me, I can't speak to uh, the discussions that the, the Qataris have had with the Iranians other than I think they are using, they are attempting to use every channel they can to get at the issue of the hostages, including via Iran. Um, well, Sec Secretary Blinken said there can be no more business as usual with, with Hamas. We are allowing Qatar to, to use him and the infrastructure and they're not having much success, and frankly, I don't think they're going to. Um, so if we're going to have a new reality, and then I go to, I, I understand releasing the hostages, but when I hear Hamas leadership say, uh, we will do October 7 again and again, when we hear them say, I believe it was today or yesterday, they are seeking permanent war because they've said, uh, one of the reasons they kicked this off is because the Palestinian issue had disappeared. Now, I would like to ask you a question about Palestinians because we're talking in this committee about Palestinians like they're only in Gaza and the West Bank. They're not. I think they're now on their fourth generation in the Jordanian refugee camps. Is that correct? Probably the fourth generation. So just talk to us about your why are we equating Palestinians to Gaza and the West Bank? Uh, no, no nation in the Middle East wants the Palestinians, hence the refugee camps. 
Well, I, I guess the way I would characterize uh, the general um, perspective of most all the governments in the Middle East, to my knowledge, they all support the creation of a Palestinian state and for the Palestinians to govern themselves in that state. Um, well, no state is willing to give them land for it. So how many, here's another question for you. How many nations have actually uh, repudiated the three no's? What, about five? No, I'd have to, I'd have to think about that, but no, more than five. More than five, okay. We, we, yes, because, I mean, you've got Morocco, UAE, Bahrain, Jordan, Egypt. That's about five. UAE. Uh, and then de facto, you have several other countries that work very uh, closely with Israel openly on, on different matters. Yeah. The gentleman's time has expired. Time has expired. Uh, chair now recognizes Mr. Schneider. Uh, thank you, and I want to thank the witnesses for uh, your patience with us here today. Uh, a couple of real quick questions. When did Israel pull out of Gaza? In 2005, Five. yes. And who was in control after Israel left? Well, initially the PA, and then there was a coup, so it was Hamas after that. And when did the coup happen? 2007. Right. And since 2007, when Gaza violently uh, threw out Fatah and, and took over Gaza, how many escalatory conflicts have there been between Israel and Hamas that have resulted in a negotiated ceasefire? At least six. At, at least six. And, and they have been very tenuous ceasefires. They have been, they've been good for a couple days, good for a couple months, and then they've collapsed. Yeah. Um, when was the last ceasefire negotiated before this conflict? 2021. Uh, I think it was May 19, 2021, 870 days before October 7th. Uh, what was the status of the ceasefire on October 6th? Was Israel observing it? Well, you know, uh, yes, of course. Um, I, I would say that it was um, it was a sort of on and off again affair because you occasionally had rockets and so forth uh, pop off. So, yep. But Israel was observing it. And so I'm going to ask obvious questions. We've touched on these over the course of the day. And again, thank you for your time. But who violated the ceasefire on October 7th? Uh, very clearly, Hamas. Who slaughtered 260 young people at a music festival on October that 7th? That would be Hamas. Who murdered more than 130 people at Kibbutz Beiri on October 7th? Hamas. Who butchered children at a nursery in Kibbutz Kfar Aza on October yep. 7th? Hamas. Right. Um, is it a war crime to intentionally target civilians? Absolutely. War crime to use rape and torture as a tactic? Absolutely. To burn people alive in their homes? Absolutely. To take more than 240 people hostage? Absolutely. To deny those people who they took hostage visits from the International Committee of the Red Cross or the necessary health care? Absolutely. Is it a war crime to use an ambulance to transport fighters and weapons? Yes, it is. How about to launch rockets from civilian neighborhoods, from hospitals, mosques, and schools? Yes, it is. Using human shields, is that a war crime? It is. So let me ask a broader question, because we have talked about this war, and we went through a, a rapid-fire list of questions. But let me be very clear. I see the suffering of the civilians in this war. It's the civilians who always get caught in the middle of the war. I've said that many times. And we need to bring this war to as rapid conclusion as is humanly possible, because the civilians in Gaza and in Israel are suffering. Almost a million people have been displaced in Gaza. Almost a quarter of a million people have been displaced in Israel. But what would happen if Israel were to agree to a ceasefire before dismantling Hamas's ability to fight or to rule over Gaza? Congressman, you put your finger on the, on the issue right here, uh, and I would agree complete with you. The, 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 the suffering in Gaza among civilians is wrenching. It's emotionally wrenching for all of us who are working on this, this issue. It is wrenching for the governments and the publics in the, in the Middle East who are watching this. And on the other hand, to, um, to call a ceasefire right now, which might or might not be uh, honored uh, by Hamas, would be to leave Hamas uh, in control of 240-some uh, hostages, including babies and children, and would also leave uh, fairly well intact or much of the military infrastructure and war fighting capacity and terrorism uh, capacity of Hamas intact. Uh, let me take, build on that for one second, because you use two terms I think are important to distinguish, war fighting and terrorism. What is war fighting? And maybe, Ms. Stroll, that's the question uh, for the Department of Defense. What does it mean to say war fighting? It means to use military force to achieve an objective. Okay. Distinct from terrorism, though. Terrorism is crossing a border, beheading babies, raping women, killing concertgoers. Its intention is to 
cause trauma and terror, terror to an entire society. Isn't that correct? The point is terror. The war fighting is soldier on soldier. But as we saw on October 7th, uh, what Hamas did was in no way a war. It was pure terrorism. And has it been United States message, President Biden, and let me say this, thank goodness for President Biden. His moral clarity and political courage in this uh, conflict has been just extraordinary. I know it is appreciated by the people in Israel, and it should be equally appreciated by the people in the United States and around the world. But has he made it clear that Israel's a right to defend itself but when we talk about that, is in the context of war fighting. Absolutely, and it has a it has an obligation to defend its people from terrorism okay. and from the kind of attacks that we saw on October. Right. I, I'm I'm out of time. Let me comment on two last things. Uh, one is a quote that you said at the very beginning in your opening remarks: "The U.S. commitment to Israel is ironclad." Um, we've said that. The president has said that. Is it fair to also say that the U.S. commitment, as it has been in Camp David, in you? bringing peace to Egypt and Israel, in the Oslo Accords, in the negotiations between Jordan and Israel for peace, in the leadership it has showed in the Abraham Accords. It's also fair that the United States is also committed to bringing peace to both Israel and the Palestinians once Hamas is defeated. Absolutely, and it's the only way that we will not see a terrible repeti repetition of these events. Thank you, I yield back. So when yields, uh, Chair recognizes Mr. James. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ambassador Lee, thank you for your time and uh, for your stamina. I have a quick question for you, uh, followed by a couple others. Um, how do we address the anti-Semitism at the UN? Uh, that's an excellent. Uh, that's an excellent question, and I'm not sure I could give you a, a, a five-minute or a four-minute, thirty-six-second uh, uh, answer to that. Um, it is. It is really something that we've seen for years. Um, and it is a very casual kind of anti-Semitism um, that we see among uh, some member states. Um, and Madam, I, I would uh, respectfully correct you. There's no such thing as casual anti-Semitism. But uh, let, me, let me try. Uh, earlier this year, I led uh, 30 of my colleagues in sending a letter to the State Department promoting the Abraham Accords in Africa. I share this with you because I believe that the Trump administration's vision of peace in the Middle East and abroad is in jeopardy following the horrendous attack on October 7th. Uh, this was an attack against not just innocent Israelis, but uh, on, on humanity broadly. Um, there's a sense that advancements uh, in Israeli normalization uh, might be on long pause, that this bloodshed on October 7th of innocent civilians on all sides might yield yet another generation of dispute, terror, and meaningless death. Is that also your assessment? Oh, there's a great risk of that, yes. Okay. Uh, so, Ms. Strong, um, the Abraham Accords, I believe, was our, our best diplomatic strategy to box out Iran and to show the world that American leadership can truly lead to peace, which we've done so many times in our great nation's history. Uh, part of what we're seeing with the United Nations uh, in the destabilization that is being fomented by Russia and China is that they are trying to break the global south away from alignment with the United States that impedes our interests abroad and threatens America and our allies. The progress that was meant to be made instead of launching bombs and firing bullets through extending the Abraham Accords to Africa, we could exchange culture and forge partnerships. Since the future is unknown on how the gaps will be bridged between Israel and the Arab world, how best can we avoid further entanglements with Iran and its proxies if we don't take steps like the Abraham Accords that have already worked to curb the growing spheres of communist influence emanating from Beijing and Moscow through Tehran right now? Thank you for that question. What is clear is that Iran, Russia, and China all view themselves as benefiting from challenging the rules-based international order. And the United States and our coalition of allies and partners benefits from enforcing and standing up for the rules-based international order. That includes standing up for Israel's ability to defend itself from terrorism, given what it just experienced from Hamas on October 7. And it also includes standing up and supporting Ukraine and in its war to defend itself 
from Russian aggression. Uh, the Department of Defense was building on the progress of the Abraham Accords through advancing regional security constructs, such as integrated air and missile defense, uh, multilateral cooperation at sea in the maritime domain. And what we're actually seeing now is that partners, even today, view that as beneficial to be cooperating, sharing intelligence, sharing information, and seeing the threats coming from Iran. Totally agree. Uh, forgive me for cutting you off. Um, but uh, one of the big things I'm very concerned with is exactly supporting that mission um, and, and boosting our capacity uh, to satisfy our obligations under FMS uh, and getting our defense industrial base in a position where it can not only support our allies, but most especially help America to defend itself. And so I'm working on, on that uh, as well. But uh, in the limited time that we do have, I would like to turn back to Ambassador Leaf. Uh, have you vocalized to President Biden or to Secretary Blinken any concerns for the lack of sanctions enforcement on Iran and the consequences that would manifest itself through that, like we saw on October 7th? Uh, uh, before you answer, in the last couple seconds, uh, it was widely reported this past August that there was a relaxing of sanctions on Iran to increase the supply of oil into the world so that we could have cheaper uh, uh, oil here in America. Uh, are you getting any indication that there are any relaxation of sanctions on Iran um, due, to, due to this no. issue? No, absolutely not, Congressman. Mr. Chairman, I yield. Gentleman yields. Uh, chair recognizes Ms. Kamlager Dove. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for uh, being here today, witnesses. Um, so I'll just say many of my Jewish constituents have loved ones in Israel who were impacted by the Hamas terrorist attacks on October 7th. And the trauma lives on with the missing hostages held in Gaza, including my constituent's grandniece, three-year-old Abigail, whose parents were killed by Hamas before she was kidnapped. Jewish and Israeli Americans have come together with Muslim and Palestinian Americans to deplore the terror and violence that innocent Palestinians are enduring in Gaza. And we are seeing an appalling rise in anti-Semitism and Islamophobia in my district and beyond. No one feels safe. I want peace. I think we all want peace. I hope we all believe that all people have the right to live with dignity, self-determination, without fear of extinction. What is abundantly clear to me is that after decades of negligence, now is the time for the United States and the international community to put our diplomatic might behind a sustainable long-term political solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Israel's security depends on it, Palestinians' humanity depends on it, and the liberal international order may suffer a fatal blow without it. I think one way to decapitate Hamas is to give the Palestinians another option. So, Secretary Leaf, how is the administration signaling that a two-state solution is the only kind of end um, that the United States will accept to this conflict? So, Congresswoman, you have, have really nicely summed up exactly where uh, the administration is, that there is urgency to, to doing exactly that, pointing the way, but more than pointing the way, building the pathway to a negotiated um, uh, Palestinian state. Um, and Secretary Link, uh, Blinken um, has been signaling that privately and publicly um, over these last over this last period, he was uh, quite to the point on this with both the Palestin Palestinian uh, Authority, uh, President Mahmoud Abbas, and with all of our Arab partners and and with our Israeli partners, frankly, because this is sort of the missing element at the heart of the story, uh, the unresolved quest for statehood by the Palestinians. And another thing that you you put your finger on, which I I, I found very much. Um, uh, mirrored in Israel and the West Bank, um, uh, Israeli Jews are afraid of Israeli Arabs. Israeli Arabs are afraid of uh, Jew, Israeli Jews. Palestinians are afraid of, of Israelis, and 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 Israelis are certainly terrified of, of Palestinians. There is a heightened state of fear and anxiety there among all the communities, which I, you know, as you said, is is reflected here in our own country, um, and the way that we begin to to 
pull people back from that state of anxiety and mistrust of the other is uh, precisely by going to the heart of the matter and um, helping the Palestinians in their quest for statehood. So do you have any concern that this war will grow more hardliners on both sides, folks absolutely. that want to? Absolutely. Okay. And how do we prevent that? Getting the, uh, getting the conflict to, to an end as rapidly as possible and, getting, and making sure that Hamas is driven out of business. And I would just say that the, the Secretary has a sort of turn of phrase about this. He said you, you can not completely, you can destroy a military capability, a terrorist organization, but you can't kill an idea except with a better idea. And that's Palestinian statehood. So we talked about, you know, getting rid of the Taliban from Afghanistan. That has not happened. So we talk about, oh, we have to completely destroy Hamas. How does that happen? Because like you said, you cannot destroy ideas. It's a political process. It's a political, it's a political issue at the heart of it, which is the unresolved quest for statehood. And that is something that we can lead on and will lead on. Can you have success without diplomacy? No, it is absolutely critical to do it diplomatically. How are we working, given Netanyahu has stalled or um, rejected the U.S. call for a humanitarian pause. Um, does this remain a priority for us, and how do we move the needle with Israel on this? Uh, we are working relentlessly on the issue of humanitarian pause. I, um, last question, I know that the Palestinians were told to evacuate to the south from the north, and then they also have concerns about permanent displacement. So how do we still move innocent Palestinians to safety uh, so that we can minimize the casualties of innocent Palestinians? We've been crystal clear on the issue of displacement that we will not, that we will oppose any displacement, any population transfer of Palestinians outside Gaza, full stop. The question of getting Palestinian communities out of harm's way within Gaza is another question. And that is something that we have really urged uh, the Israelis, the IDF, to look to uh, with care and attention, but we will not. Um, we will. We will oppose any displacement of the Palestinians outside their own territory. Thank you for your responses. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Jolly yields. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Moran. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to Assistant Secretary Leaf and to Assistant Secretary Struhl for your I, I testimony. Can, I, I'll keep your time for you. I, I have to leave, unfortunately. But I just want to thank the two of you for being so patient and staying with us for so long. Um, and it's been very helpful having you here today. And thanks for putting up with everything else. And I yield back to the gentleman from Texas. Thank you to the uh, other gentleman from Texas. Um, ladies, I, I, want to, I want to ask you about, uh, first of all, uh, the Gaza Ministry of Health, the information we're getting from them, and what really appears to be some reliance on them uh, for information I'm not so sure is correct. I, I want to just go through a few things because over uh, a number of years through several conflicts, numerous bloody skirmishes between Israel and Hamas, UN agencies, as you know, and uh, others have cited the Gaza Health Ministry's death tolls in regular reports. The International Committee of the Red Cross and the Palestinian Red Crescent also use these numbers or rely on these numbers, as does the United Nations. Uh, several news publications cite numbers from Hamas uh, for uh, their data, but frankly, I'm a little skeptical about the data that's coming out. Both uh, President Biden and the National Security Council spokesman John Kirby have been publicly skeptical of the Gaza Health Ministry's numbers and called them, quote, unreliable due to, due to its control by Hamas. Uh, and I agree with that. Um, <clears throat> Tell me a little bit about the, the types of propaganda, I'll start with uh, Assistant Secretary Leaf, that Hamas or other Iranian-backed proxies are spreading using either the, um, uh, the Ministry of Health or other organizations in, located in Palestine. So I, I would just say, Congressman, that um, Hamas is very uh, adroit um, at using social media in particular. Um, uh, to um, to circulate its propaganda, to circulate disinformation, misinformation. On the question you cite about statistics, I, I would just say that in a, this period of, of, of conflict um, and conditions of, of war, um, it is very difficult for any of us to assess what the, what the rate of casualties are. We think they're very high, frankly, and it could be that they're even higher than are being cited. We'll know only after the guns fall silent. So uh, I, you know, we we take sort we take in sourcing from a variety of um, 
of folks who were on the ground. Um, and so I, I can't I can't stipulate to one figure or another, but I think they it, it's very possible that they're even higher than than is being reported. I appreciate that answer because that kind of goes to my next question. I was going to ask specifically about the number 10,000. That's the number that as of November the 6th is being reported as the number of Palestinians in Gaza who have been killed. And my question to you was going to be, do, you, do we think that number is higher? Do we think it's lower? Do we have any visibility? Do we have any uh, uh, reliable information that would give us some indication one way or the other on that number? I mean, as I say, we have a lot of different sources from, from people that we, we know that are on the ground that are NGOs and others who are operating their um, UNRWA and so forth. And I think we'll only have a, a faithful figure um, at the end, uh, tragically. Um, but I would just say, you know, when I, you know, as a point of comparison, um, Gaza Strip is about 25 miles in length and 7 to 12 um, uh, miles in, in, um, in, in width. And you've got 2.2 million or thereabouts uh, people compressed into um, a piece of land that is, well, it's comparable to Rhode Island, I guess, but I think Rhode Island is actually a bit larger and is half the population. So in these extraordinarily dense um, uh, confines, it, it just stands to reason there, that there are very high casualties. In, in my last minute, I want to switch gears and, and ask both of you about uh, Iran's participation. Early on in the assault, it appeared that there were advanced missiles and drones targeting uh, civilians and civilian infrastructure used by Hamas. Uh, information that's come to me indicates that it would be Iran that really has provided that to them, either as a proxy or directly. And so what is it that we need to be doing to push back against Iran's participation in Hamas's terrorist attacks that started October the 7th and continue to today? So the question of, of you know, a direct Iranian um, involvement in that operation is still, uh, still a, a question that analysts are looking at very closely. I heard a variety of opinions from intelligence services when I was out in the region uh, um, with some officials saying that they found um, that even the political elements of Hamas were clearly in a state of, of, of surprise on October 7th, that this was a very uh, uh, siloed operation um, and that other elements of the so-called axis uh, were in the dark. All that said, uh, it's fair to say that Iran set the table for this in, in the years of support it gave to uh, training and lethal aid and finances to Hamas and to other elements of the of, of proxies. Um, we need to strangle the financing. Um, the weaponry, a lot of that has apparently been uh, manufactured on site in Gaza, underground. So there's been an enormous amount of smuggling. We're going, to, we're very dedicated to the proposition of helping Egypt do what's necessary to really tighten uh, its border controls and its screening. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Leaf. Assistant Secretary Struhl, you got left out. I'm so sorry about that, but ma'am, I appreciate uh, both of your time today. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Congressman Moran. We now proceed to Congressman Tom Keen of New Jersey. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, on the morning of Saturday, October 7th, Hamas launched the most brutal and expansive surprise attack on Israel since the Yom Kippur War 50 years ago. And while these attacks may have been perpetrated by Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad, let's not forget that the real architects and motivator behind these actions is Iran. I, like many in this committee, support Israel's right to self-defense and stand ready to ensure that it has whatever it needs to ensure its survival. I, um, like others on this committee, share the concern that any pause will only allow Hamas to continue in its terroristic activities, and we need to be united in our efforts to ensure that we, de de we defeat the evil that is Hamas. Can you walk us through um, a little bit now what, what are Hamas's current sources of funding and what diplomatic conversations is the administration having to try to limit funds to Hamas from jurisdictions that previously allowed the funds to flow to this terrorist group. 
So uh, we are really constructing a, a wide-ranging diplomatic effort on this front, and I, I think that we'll go back to um, you know the efforts that we had uh, that, against ISIS, for instance, or Al Qaeda and other major terrorist organizations. The the effort to dry up the funding, to cut it off from both governments, but also private uh, donations, is a long sort of trench warfare, and that's what we're going to be doing globally, going around to just restrict and uh, break up. Are you support. already doing that? I'm sorry. We are. Okay. We have started on that. Yes, we have. Okay. And uh, what is your assessment of Hezbollah's current pace of attacks against Israel? And what is Hezbollah hoping to achieve with these attacks? Um, the current rate of attacks against Israel from, from its northern border uh, is escalating. Uh, what we know is that Hamas or Hezbollah has an even larger missile arsenal than than Hamas, uh, and by orders of magnitude. By orders of magnitude, and um, it is seeking to threaten uh, the security of the state of Israel, which is why hundreds of thousands of Israeli citizens have evacuated from the north. What consequences will Iran face from the U.S. for its for its support of Hamas? I would say, first of all, it's not just a question of what consequences Iran will face from the United States. Iran should face consequences from the international community, from the region, and from everyone who shares an interest in a rules-based international order in which a state actor uh, funds non-state actors, arms, trains, equips, and directs them. So it's not just only about what the United States is doing, which is demonstrating a willingness and readiness to use military force multiple times in this administration and most recently only an hour ago, as well as the increases in force posture, the robust sanctions implementation, and the diplomatic coordination. And we're urging all of our, our allies and partners as well to impose consequences and costs on Iran for its support for terrorism. Um, you anticipated my next question, which is regarding the EU and the fact it had a divided response in consequence of these attacks. How are you helping ensure that, that the EU, as well as going into the issue that you know, that Congressman James talked about at the uh, UN, how are we ensuring that any of these broader organizations are standing um, up against evil and supporting good? That's the labor-intensive efforts of, of diplomatic work, and that's something that we're very focused on. As my colleague said, um, this. I, I would put it um, in, in, in the way that I did with a number of our partners as I worked around the region this past several weeks. This crisis really illuminated starkly for all of them what they all knew intellectually, or they knew through their intelligence, which was Iran had this architecture of, of proxies. But they all sort of came up on the net, as it were, with this crisis. And you see uh, the Houthis you know, just really desperate to get into the fight. You see the Iraqi militia groups and the threat that they pose in multiple directions, including the state of Iraq. So this has really highlighted for everyone, if they needed highlighting, um, how destructive this architecture is to everyone's interests. So it is, um, we'll, we'll have some hard conversations with those who are um, slow to the punch. If, if we need to have, with respect, successful conversations, not hard conversations. We don't successful. get credit for trying. We get credit for results. I agree with you, Congressman. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Congressman Tom Kane. And uh, eight weeks ago today, I was meeting with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and I gave him the Tom Kane presentation, the American people will stand with Israel, whatever it takes for their survival. We know it's appropriate that we conclude um, with an outstanding freshman, Congressman Mike Lawler of New York. Thank you, Chairman. Um, last month, President Biden announced $100 million in humanitarian aid uh, for the Gaza Strip. Uh, obviously, uh, no one wants to see innocent life uh, lost or impacted uh, by uh, the ongoing conflict. However, I have great concern about this $100 million uh, and uh, the reality uh, that Hamas, as the governing body in Gaza, uh, would intercept 
or use these funds uh, to further fund terrorism, to further fund uh, the slaughtering of Jews. Who is receiving these funds? And what accountability measures are there to ensure uh, that Hamas does not have access to it? Uh, and what would be the response of the administration uh, if they found uh, that, in fact, these funds were somehow being utilized to further Hamas's terrorism? So, uh, you know, at this moment, I, you know, it's hardly possible to say that Hamas is governing. It is down. Uh, you would agree they are the government of No, no I understand that. I understand. I'm, I'm okay. not disputing that. I'm just saying at this moment in this conflict, nobody's governing. Uh, no, the, they're the, using their civilians as human shields. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. That's what I mean. Um, but this is coordinated fully with Israel. Uh, this, these monies will have oversight, rigorous oversight. They will be, it will be run through trusted partners. It is really di directed at humanitarian, critical humanitarian assistance in the first order. So when you say in concert with Israel, uh, are the funds going to Israel to administer? Who, who no, is administering Israel, the funds? No, Israel has made it clear that he does not want to be in the business of administrating, administering anything in Gaza. So who's administering it? We, are, we have the oversight, and we go through trusted uh, partners, NGOs. Who are our trusted partners? I can get you a list of those, sir. Please. Um, in terms of Iran, uh, it is clear uh, to many of us, uh, includes, including from reporting uh, by the Wall Street Journal, uh, that Iran played some role uh, in uh, the lead up to these attacks, that Iran has uh, continually uh, backed and funded Hamas, uh, that the stated intention uh, ultimately is to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. We all acknowledge that. Um, Do you uh, believe that the administration uh, is prepared to hold Iran accountable? Uh, and in what way? Because I just passed last week uh, the SHIP Act, which would increase uh, secondary sanctions uh, on countries that purchase Iranian petroleum. Uh, since Joe Biden took office, uh, Iranian uh, petroleum sales and the revenue thereof has increased by 59 percent. What is the administration doing to hold Iran accountable? Thank you for your question. Uh, we have made it clear that Iranian fingerprints are all over the funding arming, training, equipping, and directing of a variety of non-state actors from Hamas to Lebanese Hezbollah to the Iran-aligned militia groups in Iraq and Syria to the Houthis in Yemen. And we do hold Iran responsible and accountable for the acts of terrorism we see in the region. As recently as this evening, when President Biden ordered precision strikes against IRGC-affiliated facilities in eastern Syria. Does the administration deny or confirm uh, the Wall Street Journal's uh, previous reporting about Iran's involvement in the October 7th terrorist attacks? The administration has been very clear that Iran has had a role through its arming, training, equipping, and funding of Hamas. Does the administration confirm or deny the reports of the Wall Street Journal with respect to, to the, the October 7th? Wall Street Journal article. What Assistant Secretary Leaf also said earlier is that there is not a smoking gun piece of intelligence that confirms that Iran directed the specific nature, scope, scale, and timing of the October 7 attack. But there's no question that Iran is responsible because of its arming, training, funding, and equipping of Hamas. Given, given that and given your statement there, should the $6 billion in unfrozen funds be permanently refrozen? 
that would be a decision for um, senior level of the government. But at this point, <clears throat> that six billion dollars has not been touched, and it is uh, the the um, the the use of it is for humanitarian purposes only. I yield back. Thank you very much, Congressman Lawler and Secretary Leaf and Secretary Struhl. Uh, thank you so much for being here, and I think you can see uh, that you have uh, bipartisan support of uh, Republicans, Democrats. Uh, we want you to succeed. Uh, uh, additionally, uh, lightning is going to strike, but I agree with the Washington Post. Uh, this, uh, we want the president to succeed. This is going to be his legacy, uh, and we have an existential situation developing uh, with an axis of evil, with war criminal Putin, the Chinese Communist Party, and indeed, uh, Iran, Iran and Iranian puppets. And it must be addressed, and we want you to succeed. And so God, just understand, it, it's just uh, for our families, uh, and with the potential, uh, as the New York Post has reported, of a potential terrorist attack here in the United States is uh, imminent. Um, what you're doing is so important, and we want you to succeed. Additionally, as we conclude, I want to thank the staff. Uh, it's amazing uh, their persistence to be here 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And with this, we shall adjourn. Thank you, Congressman.